good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the June 2nd, 2021 meeting of the Daytona Beach City Commission. We're delighted to have each of you with us this evening. And at this time, we would ask that Ms. LaMagna review the procedures for tonight's meeting. Good evening. Agendas are available on the table in the lobby and at the front of the commission chambers. All exhibits pertaining to items on the agenda are posted in the lobby. Please feel free to view the exhibits at any time during tonight's meeting. You are required to fill out a yellow form to speak before the city commission during the business meeting. Forms are available on the table in the lobby and at the front of the room of the commission chambers. You must complete the sections that ask for your name, address, agenda item number, signature, and date. The form must be completed and placed in the designated box. Agenda items under item number nine are public hearings and citizens may speak at the designated time. Resolutions under administrative items number 10 are open for public comment and you may fill out a yellow form to speak when that item is called. Item number seven is your opportunity to address the city commission concerning any item on the consent agenda. Please indicate on the yellow speaker sheet the agenda item number of the item or items that you are addressing. Items or discussions not listed on the consent agenda will not be heard during this comment section. All citizens completing a yellow form will be allowed to speak for two and a half minutes. When you approach a lectern, please speak clearly into the microphone and give your full name and address. The two and a half minute clock on the monitor above the dais will start running when you begin to speak. Pay close attention to your time. You will be told when your time has expired. Item number 13 is the public comment forum and it will convene after the adjournment of the business meeting. This is the opportunity for the public to speak on any issue that is not on the business meeting agenda. All citizens completing the green form will be allowed to speak for two and a half minutes. When you approach the lectern, please give your full name and address. Disorderly conduct in the public meeting of the City Commission. Article 2, Section 6238 of the City Code of Ordinances reads as follows. It shall be unlawful for any person to behave in a riotous or disorderly manner in any public meeting of the City Commission or any committee, agency, or board thereof, or to cause any unnecessary disturbances therein by force, shouting, or any other action that is calculated to disrupt such meeting, or to refuse to obey the, any ruling of the presiding officer for such meeting relative to the orderly process thereof. Please be courteous and respectful of the views of others. Personal attacks on the city commission, city staff, or members of the public are not allowed. Please silence cell phones and other wireless devices during the meeting. All conversation must take place either at the lectern or on the dais so that everyone can hear the business being discussed tonight. <clears throat> Ms. LaMagna, may we have a roll call? Commissioner Delgado. Present. Commissioner May. Commissioner Cantu. Here. Commissioner Henry. Here. Commissioner Reed. Here. Commissioner Traeger. Here. Derek, Mayor Derek L. Henry. <coughs> uh, here. Uh, we will now have our um, invocation by Commissioner Henry, uh, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance by Commissioner Delgado. Gracious Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to gather again today. We thank you for all that you have given us and all of the requirements that you have required for of us. We ask and pray, Heavenly Father, that you will bless us, that you will guide us, and that you will lead us as we make the very best decisions for the citizens of Daytona Beach. In your son Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll now move on to item number four, which is approval of the minutes of the May 5th, 2021 regular city commission meeting. So moved. Second. We'll take a motion from Commissioner Traeger and a second from Commissioner Reed. Do we have any uh, questions or comments about the uh, minutes? Uh, hearing none, all those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Uh, those opposed, same sign. This motion carries 6-0. At this time, we will have our agenda uh, approval. If there are any changes, our city manager, Mr. Fiatra, will address them. Yes, Honorable Mayor, Commissioners, we do have two changes that we want to um, present. Um, we're asking that uh, um, agenda item 10B relative to the Beach Street Streetscape Phase 2 um, be removed from the agenda. Also, doing um, a discussion with Commissioner May, a request was made for Andy Holmes to give a TPO update. And, Mayor, we discussed that, and you have 
said that will be fine at the beginning of the meeting. Those are the only two changes we have for tonight's meeting. Change. Motion to accept the agenda with the said changes. Second. I have a motion from Commissioner Reed and a second from Commissioner Delgado. Um, all those in favor, uh, let it be noted by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries 7-0. May the record reflect that Commissioner May is also present. Okay, we're going to move on to item number six, and we're going to do the added presentation by um, the Public Works Director, Andrew Holmes, on the TPO. Good evening, Andy Holmes, Public Works, and thank you for the opportunity to give you this brief update on the TPO activities. I sit on the Technical Coordinating Committee. Uh, on behalf of the city of Daytona Beach. And our function on the technical committee is to review and comment on technical issues and to make recommendations to the full board that Commissioner May sits on. Our last meeting was Tuesday, May 18th. And at that meeting, there were a couple of items of significant interest to the city of Daytona Beach. Uh, we reviewed and approved a recommendation of approval for the, an amendment to the transportation improvement plan and this is the list of projects that get funded by the TPO. So this is very significant because a project cannot get funded if it's not listed on the transportation improvement plan. Uh, we did two projects, added two projects that were significant to Daytona. One is the Fremont Avenue sidewalk. We programmed construction funding of just short of $320,000 for that project. And then the second project, we increased uh, funding for design of the Safe Routes to School project, which is another sidewalk project in the vicinity of Campbell Middle School and the small elementary school. Uh, the increased funding for design is for this current fiscal year, $171,177 for that. And we increase the construction funding, which is in fiscal 23-24, to $952,000. So those are two significant positives for the city of Daytona Beach. Uh, also reviewed funding set asides for the next five years of traffic operations, 5.7 million, and bike and ped for 3.2 million. And that does not include the coronavirus response and relief funds that they're anticipating getting some of those too. So some very positive funding news uh, from the TPO. Uh, the I-95 resurfacing project, you know, are within the limits of Daytona Beach. Uh, starting up now, it's about an $18 million project, and it will last approximately to next early summer, late spring, early summer next year. Uh, this is a mill and resurface from just south of Dunn Avenue to Airport Road in Ormond Beach. So lots of good transportation improvement improvements coming to our city. So okay. be happy to take any questions. B, please. Yeah, East ISB, we've received uh, revised plans from FDOT that are minimizing the amount of utility work that we have to do, so that cost is going to be less than we anticipated. And FDOT is going to be starting the design of the underground utilities there for us, um, but they, they've got to have right-of-way in place to do that. And so the right-of-way acquisition phase is just just about to begin for mm -hmm. FDOT. And I'm asking these questions for the people at home who are listening. Sure. So um, we're still on track for start dates and everything seems to be progressing really nicely then. It is progressing. Uh, I, I can't speak to specifically whether they're going to make their start date, but they're doing all the activities as if they're trying to do that. And then also, could you please address, um, we addressed it in the meeting on the Wednesday, could you please address your impressions of, let's say, the west side LPGA area? Do you have any thoughts on what's going to be happening there in terms of funding for improving the transportation at all? We've gotten an invoice for the $250,000 that the commission voted to contribute to the PD&E study for the bridge replacement over the Tomoka River. And I know that they are moving ahead with that PD&E study and they've extended that study. So the limits are basically from the west side of the interchange all the way to ISB, to West ISB along LPGA Boulevard. And so that's very positive. Uh, positive indication for that area. Sure, and so then my request is to the commission, if you have any um, areas of concern in your local zones, if you could just let me know, send me a quick note so that I can address it at the TPO meeting and bring up some of your concerns. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you very much. Happy to help. Thanks, Andy. And if we send that note, we'll make sure that we send it through Bob's office so that uh, if it comes to something that we have to vote on, or just make sure that we don't correspond back and forth, as we know. But I know Bob normally would say that, so I'm surprised he didn't, Thank you. didn't say it. <laughs> Should have stepped in. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. And is, is that it? All right. Good job, Andy. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to item number seven. This is citizen comments by people addressing the city commission on any item that is on the consent agenda. And I have one speaker, Mr. John Nicholson. And I believe is speaking on 8C. And as he's coming, uh, Andy, uh, the manager is going to ask you to give me some kind of correspondence on what you just talked about as I have a presentation. Thank you. John Nicholson, 413 North Grandview Avenue. Uh, with regard to the um, flooding, um, I used to work on Nova and Orange Avenue for several years, and when it flooded, it flooded. Water went into the, those homes when somebody went down Keith Street, um, and it's still happening. Uh, the last flooding on the corner of Fairview and Beach Street, just inches away from uh, the new Brown and Brown building, it floods up to like four feet. So you can't come off of Main Street Bridge because you're going to go into water. They had to close down from Fairview to Mason Avenue on Beach Street because that flooded. So I'm asking you to be a holistic look at all over the city where, there, where it's flooding. I mean, these things have been flooding for years. So rather than, I understand that this became available and it's wise to do it when you can, but I'm also asking for a plan to look at those places that have been flooding for decades, and we take a look at it seriously because uh, we're going to have more and more flooding as time goes on, and we might as well plan now to fix those things. Thank you. And that was my only speaker for the consent agenda. I, I would uh, ask that uh, 8E be moved to the regular meeting for uh, education purposes. Uh, do I have a motion with that change? I'll make that motion, Mr. Mayor. Okay. I have a motion from Commissioner Delgado and Commissioner May is the second. All those in favor, let it be noted by saying aye. 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 Those in opposition, same sign. <coughs> motion carries 7-0. Uh, <clears throat> Moving on to item number nine, which is our public hearings. Item 9A is the Development and Administrative Services Planning Division, Neighborhood F, Large-Scale Comprehensive Plan Amendment. This is an ordinance on first reading public hearing. An ordinance adopting a large-scale comprehensive plan amendment in accordance with Chapter 163, Part 2, Florida Statutes, deleting a Neighborhood F future land use policy that prohibits retail uses on properties adjacent to South Ridgewood Avenue from South Street to Wilder Boulevard, repealing all ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict or with, and providing an effective date. So moved. Second. We have a motion from Commissioner uh, May and a second from Commissioner Delgado. I have no speakers for this item. Uh, no speakers. Okay. All those in favor, let it be noted by saying aye. 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 Those in opposition, same sign. Uh, major motion carries 7-0. Uh, Moving on to item number 9B. It's a public works, Clyde Morris Landings, preliminary and final plat approval. This is a resolution quasi judicial hearing. A resolution approving the preliminary and final plat for the Clyde Morris Landings project, a mixed use development of approximately 37.9 acres of land located on the east side of Clyde Morris Boulevard, 2,000 feet south of LPJ, authorizing the city manager to sign the final plat and permit recordation, thereupon meeting certain conditions precedent and providing an effective date. So moved. Second. We have a motion from Commissioner May and a second from Commissioner Delgado. And I do have Jessica Gao here on behalf of the applicant for any questions. Do we have any questions of Ms. Gao? No questions. Mm -hmm. All right. All those in um, favor, let it be noted by saying aye. 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 Those in opposition, same sign. Motion carries 7-0. And for the record, I had no other speakers for this item. 
Moving on to item number 9C, it's a public works department, preliminary and final plat for Champions Quarter Project. This is a resolution quasi-judicial hearing. A resolution approving the preliminary and final plat for Champions Quarters, a single family subdivision located on the north side of Clyde Morris Boulevard, east of Jimmy Ann Drive, authorizing the city manager to sign the final plat and permit recordation, thereupon meeting certain conditions precedent, providing for recordation, and providing an effective date. So moved. All right, we have a motion from Commissioner Delgado, second from Commissioner May. And I do have Jessica, Jessica Gow here on behalf of the applicant for any questions and no others. All right, good. all right. We have a motion and a second. No question for Jessica. All those in favor, let it be noted. Which item is this, 10A? Sorry. 9C. 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 Okay, I'll make sure I'm not on the wrong one. <laughs> Got a highlighter in the wrong place. Okay, all those in favor, let it be noted by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries 7-0. Seven, uh, seven okay. Thank you. We're now going to move on to item number 10, which is our administrative items. Item number 10A is the Development and Administrative Services Planning Division, MLK Lofts Plan District Agreement Extension Resolution. A resolution extending development deadlines established by the MLK Lofts Plan District Agreement and providing an effective date. So moved. Second. second. All right, we have a motion, we have a second. Um, <clears throat> I, um, <coughs> this is was the one I was making sure I didn't had notes and um, I had some concerns with this item. Um, I, I just want to make sure, is the applicant here? Yes, sir. You are? Okay. Um, I don't have any questions, I just want to make sure that we uh, as a staff, uh, ask that our manager um, would check to make sure that um, what else you guys are doing over the next two years uh, besides simply sitting and waiting to receive the tax credits for the property. Um, you, you can feel free to address that, but I want staff to, uh, I, I know that you're waiting on a, the hope of getting the lottery, uh, but you know only 10% of the folks get the lottery. Yes, very uh, good. And that's better than the normal lottery, but this particular lottery. So uh, I'm asking that the staff would, you know, uh, even consider a, a, a reverter clause, and if not that, at least moving forward that we would be able to do that. But just monitor what they're doing and in, after monitoring what they're doing, then if this comes back to us later, we wouldn't approve that. You have anything to yeah. add um, or any thoughts to that? Yeah, um, Honorable Mayor and Commissioners, um, staff has talked about this, what other steps could be done earlier in the day. Just if the lottery does not make its way back to them, how do we um, work with the, um, the, the, the beneficial communities partners here to try to figure out if there are other ways to do this project. So I know you all are going through the process for the lottery and the tax credits, but if there are other, other areas where we can go after additional funding or work with you all, um, if the lottery does not take place, how do we make sure we still get those type of uh, affordable units on that particular property? And I think that's just something we need to discuss after we've gone through the commissioners approving this. But we wanna make sure it's a viable project even if the lottery um, doesn't come for you all, but it's still something that you can work with different partners to make sure it happens in that community. Gotcha. Um, well, Ken Boron Jr. with Beneficial Communities, address to North Miami Trail in Sarasota, Florida. And yes, we are gonna be going for tax credits again this year. The application actually just got pushed up quite a bit, mm -hmm. so it'll be at the end of August uh, this year. Typically, it's around October, uh, but this year it's at the end of August, so we got a quick turnaround time this year. Um, if we're not lucky enough to get tax credits this year, uh, that's kind of up to also the landowner, Heron Development. We're under contract with them, and we need to talk with them to see how we can proceed going forward. We would love to see some uh, affordable housing done uh, on that site. Uh, there's different, the best financing for that is the low-income housing tax credit. Uh, there's the 9% round, but there's also something called the 4% round. And we haven't run, ran the numbers for that 4% deal yet. Uh, that's something I can do and get back to staff with yeah. and see how that works. But it'll also be up to Heron Development to uh, extend a contract with an amendment uh, if they want to work with us more. So. Okay. I, it's just my perspective is that we, we, we did about as much as we could humanly do yes. to try to help them to 
be able to do a project. And so it's, it's time to now get something done. And if they can't, then I don't think we should continue to, to do this. And we should just eliminate, you know, what we've done and, uh, because we've done a lot in terms of, you know, making the exceptions. Gotcha. Okay. And I understand he's not here, but, you know, and Jeff is free to call us or whatever, but I, I, I'm sure he's watching. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I guess I'm, um, I'm going to defer to Commissioner Reed on this. This is in your zone, Commissioner Reed, and I'm just wondering what are your thoughts in terms of moving forward? Well, I am glad that, um, can you all hear me? I, I am glad that they are um, pursuing this. I, I, am, I was disappointed that it took so long for them to demolish the properties, which I know is not your concern, uh, but that needs to be so noted. And I concur that if nothing does not happen, then it is time to move on. We have had this, um, this particular property on hold for a couple of years, and I know we couldn't apply last year because New Smyrna got it. Only one city in uh, the county can do it, and you can't do it consecutive years. So they couldn't apply the last year. I'm glad that the deadline has moved forward because now with it moving forward, hopefully we'll know by October or November rather than waiting to November, October, not finding out till January, and then we'll know how to proceed. So thank you for all that you um, are striving to do for us. I know you do a beautiful project, and I look forward to something being on that site. Same here. Okay. Thank you. All thank right. you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I have a motion and a second. I do have speakers, Mr. Oh, we do? On this side. My apologies. Our first speaker is John Nicholson, and on deck is Ken Bauron. Oh, Never sorry. <laughs> and on deck is Sandy Murphy. John Nicholson, 413 North Grandview Avenue. Uh, my concern with this is, if you recall, there was another affordable housing on Madison and Beach Street uh, who was applying for the grant, and we took the backing from them for this project. We've also, from the city uh, general fund, put almost $3 million into this project, in the remodeling of uh, uh, MLK and the parking lot behind it. So we have a lot vested in this. But like ha what happens on the beach side, things sit for years and years and years. Uh, we have a project on the beach side that we've been sitting on for 30 years. It's right there on the boardwalk, and it's not doing us much good. I am glad that uh, Ms. Reed uh, made a comment that if nothing is happening, we have to pursue other interests. And there are several options, and I would ask, again, uh, as you said, that they search for those other options. You don't put all your eggs in one basket. This is something that Ms. Reed wants, and it's something that the mayor has been pushing, affordable housing. So it's, it's uh, what everybody wants. We just have to find a way of solving it, but we can't sit on our hands forever. Thank you. In, in my studies of logic, that would be described as absurdium ridiculi to say that the use of uh, funds to resurface MLK is tied to this project. Yeah, that was too. done because it needed to be done. Mm -hmm. And it should have been done 20 years ago. Um, so I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And it was voted on prior to this project. It was going to be done regardless. Period. <laughs> Period. Sandy Murphy, 136 Park Avenue. I'm in favor of the project, but I, I share your concern that things haven't progressed more clearly from here. Um, one thing that worries me is hearing that they haven't run projections for 4% because you know the, the odds of getting that 9% money are very low. Mm -hmm. And if they're going to be serious about pursuing any sources, that should be part of the figuring from the get-go. Okay. So I would like to see something else from them saying what is plan B, plan C, rather than put ourselves in a situation where that parcel isn't going to be developed for another two years if this is approved. Thank you. And my final speaker is Pierre Lewis. Uh, yeah, and, and it's my understanding and that's what I'm expecting staff mm -hmm. to do. Uh, we, we don't have to continue in this way. Okay, Mr. Lewis. Uh, Pierre Lewis, 130 South Franklin Street, even to the mayor and to the commissioners <clears throat> and to the citizens. My only comments, I'm for the project too, and I like to see something that's going on there. I was reading the recent uh, news article, so I'd like, first like to thank uh, City Commissioner Reed for some of our comments that you said that's there because of the fact that looking at having the sort of apartments on the top and the retail down there, and the reason I mention that is because if you look at the Midtown, our master plan that we have, when you look in that particular area, there's five neighborhood plans that are supposed to be there. 
one area says that in that area right there that extends from ISB down to where Orange Avenue is at, mm -hmm. that's considered, that's supposed to be Midtown um, Main Center is what it is. And when you look at that, it says in the master plan, the way that's supposed to be done, it's structured so that it's a cultural environment that's there that's built for retail. Now, how this type of project, like a, a LIDIC project, came in, I don't know. I mean, I know how, I understand how it works and stuff like that. But when you look at the master plan, how it's set up, that area where it's structured, where this particular item is going, is right smack dab in the middle of what's called that Midtown Main Center plan. And that's what's there. So I would ask the city commission that as you start to distinguish and rule upon that, you look at how this master plan is designed. How, how we're supposed to be going towards that, because a lot of that stuff that's there will clear up some of those answers to say that if the Heron group or another particular person, not picking on them, another person, we follow what's in that master plan. And that would be constructing something that's similar to what you were talking about, Commissioner Reed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Lewis, very, can I ask you a question, good. sir? How old is that plan? I'm just curious. Well, <laughs> well, as a comment said, when they first did this plan, there's actually three. There's the master plan, the PMG study, and then uh, the other one that's the area plan. The first one was done in 1997, I believe that was the original one. Then it was amended, and then they did one in 2012. Mm -hmm. They then did a, you have a master uh, area plan that area 2012. I'm sorry, that's the next one that was done. Then. That PMG study was done in 2013. The reason I mention all three of those, because when you look at them comprehensively, the way they're supposed to work together, it talks about retail, it talks about how the whole design of that is supposed to work together. But I think what's happening is, I always look at it, I talk to my friends like this, I know a couple minutes, you know, the, the hobo that comes in, he's got a bunch of holes in his pockets, and they keep patching the different holes. It still makes a pair of pants, but it's not symbolically it works together, you see what I'm getting at? And that's what I think is what's going on. Because we've had this master plan for a number of years, but what happens is we keep having project after project after project, but it doesn't work along with this plan that's here. As you see from my highlights, I've studied and read it because I'm on the Midtown Master, I'm on the board. So it's our position, well, no, I should say our position. It's my position as I look at that, is if we read that and we follow along with that, we don't have this sort of spotty kind of thing that's going on in Midtown area. Because I think if you keep doing that long enough, we'll never really have that comprehensive plan that builds on this and builds on this the next year and builds on this the next year. So when I saw it in the paper, I said, why would they have that? Because there's a neighborhood plan that's designed that's right there. That's what the master plan says. If, the neighborhood, if those five neighborhood plans are there, it's supposed to have cultural places and retail places that are there. Why would we even consider that? It's like when we had the motorcycle club that, that decided to come there. Like, why would they consider it? Because the master plan says that an African-American museum is supposed to be there. Honestly, I think what's happening is you've got this plan, the paper is there, the implementation there, because there's implementation schedules that are there that says we were supposed to complete by 2015. And it's 2021. And I look at some of those okay. bullets, and I think to myself, wow, OK, I'll let that one go. We, we get yes, the sir. point, but you yes, also have, we all also have to be cognizant of the fact that the market truly drives in large part. Totally agree. You know, what happens. And that's, that doesn't mean you shouldn't have standards and expectations and aspire to build according to the plan. Of course. But, uh, you know, that's, I, I, I understand. Because they got a massive plan on, on Beach Street. Yeah, exactly. The market drives that and drives yeah. us too. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so much. You. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. And that was my final speaker on this item. All right. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Uh, any questions or further comments? All those in favor, let it be known uh, by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries 7 0. Okay. Item 10B was pulled from tonight's agenda, so we're going to move on to item 10C, which is the City Manager's Office Economic Development Board Appointment Resolution. A resolution appointing one member to the Economic Development Advisory Board to serve a three year term expiring February 28, 2024, and providing an effective date. Ms. Betty Goodman to present. Good evening. This agenda item is to appoint one member to the Economic Development Advisory Board. We have three applicants for the one position. Mark Card, Christos Moronas, and Devon Morris. Therefore, this will be a ballot vote. <clears throat>
You want me to vote twice? No. <laughs> no. I just want yeah, no, I'm just teasing. Henry. Commissioner Traeger, Christos Moronis. Commissioner Delgado, Christos Moronis. Commissioner May, Moronis. Commissioner Henry, Moronis. Uh -uh. I'm sorry, that was Mayor Henry, Moronis. <laughs> Commissioner Henry Morris, Devon Morris. Commissioner Cantu, Mark Card, and Commissioner Reed, Devon Morris. Uh, four votes for Christos. Christos. Do we have a motion? Make a motion to um, Chris Moronis. Second. We have a motion and a second. No further comment or questions. All those in favor? Let it be noted by saying aye. 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 Those in opposition, same sign. Motion carries 7 0. Hey, and and there I was no public comment for that matter. Thanks. No. Moving on to item 10D, it's the City Manager's Office Historic Preservation Board Appointments Resolution. A resolution appointing four members to the Historic Preservation Board for three year terms expiring April 14, 2024, and providing an effective date. Betty Goodman. This agenda item is to appoint four members to the Historic Preservation Board. The first appointment is really a reappointment of Roman Yerkowitz to architect. May we please have a motion? So moved. Second. All right. We have a motion from Commissioner May, second from Commissioner Traeger. Okay. We can do the entire slate, Mayor. All right. Okay. The second is Bernardo Neves, appointment to Zone 2, Commissioner Delgado. So moved. Okay. All right. The third is Joseph Vetter, appointment for Zone 6, Commissioner Reed. So moved. Second. And the last is Alicia Mom point, and it's an at-large appointment, Mayor Henry. Um, just if someone would motion for me. So move. Okay. Well, we'll just do the whole slate at one time. Right. Yeah. So that's, I, I would want to appoint mom point. So will someone nominate the entire slate? Motion to nominate the entire slate. Second. All right. Uh, we have a motion from Commissioner Delgado and a second from Commissioner Reed. Um, no questions, no public speakers? No public speakers. All right. All those in favor, let it be noted by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries 7 0. Okay. Moving on to item 10 E, the City Manager's Office Personnel Board Appointment Resolution. A resolution appointing one member to the person Personnel Board for a four year term expiring June 16, 2025, and providing an effective date, Ms. Betty Goodman, to report. We have one application for this one opening, and that is from Cindy Singer, and it's also a mayoral nomination. So move. Second. Okay, how do you all know I want Cindy Singer? <laughs> <laughs> I know she's the only one on there, but I might want to go back and nom I, he's, that's good. He's good. I didn't know. I'm kidding. <laughs> Who, who made the motion? Commissioner Cantu. Commissioner Cantu. And who made the second? Commissioner Delgado. All right, we have a motion and a second. Do we have any public speakers? We do not. All right. All those in favor, let it be noted by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Thank you. Motion carries 7 0. Thank okay. you, Ms. Goodman. We're now going to move back to item 8E, which was pulled from the consent agenda by Mayor Henry. 
Um, the 8E is the Public Works Technical Services Division, PNS Paving Inc., Derbyshire Neighborhood Sidewalks Project Bid Award Resolution. A resolution accepting the bid of PNS Paving Inc. for the Derbyshire Neighborhood Sidewalks Project Phase 1 for a total amount of $746,919.80. Authorizing the mayor and the city clerk to execute the contract in accordance with the bid documents and return of the bid security of all unsuccessful bidders and providing an effective date. So moved. Second. Second. We have a motion from Commissioner Henry and a second from Commissioner Delgado. Um, well, I, I asked for education purposes. Um, not all sidewalks are created equal in the city. And this one is not equal to most sidewalks. It's probably one of the most dangerous uh, streets that you have for young people to try to get to a recreation center in, in our city. So um, the manager was sharing with me how uh, we were discussing earlier today how this street will be connected to others and how, you know, and I, I know the street and I know, you know, when we built the Scarlet Golden Center, immediately the first thing that we said was we wanted these sidewalks. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately things don't happen as quickly as we sometimes want them to happen. Uh, and we're just fortunate that we haven't had serious, to my knowledge, catastrophic uh, accidents along this roadway. But this is something that, it, you know, when I was commissioner, I would have wanted to have a block party knowing that this was coming in, coming to fruition. And for me, it's that big a deal because it really is a big step to making our community safer on all fronts. So I want to commend uh, staff uh, for making this happen and um, I want to make sure that we get the word out uh, just how big and how important this is. Um, Thank you. Mayor, I will say that um, Andy um, with Public Works, that was one of the, the key things when I met with him. Um, he has a, the master plan that deals with that park and how he believes that the connectivity is needed for sidewalks. So I'm um, just commend him and his staff because the presentation he provided me this demonstrates that he wants to make sure that there is connectivity and that there is safety for not only the children, but parents that may be all of them. So I applaud him and his staff for what he's done on this item. And I think we're going to see more of this in the future. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right, we have a motion. Do y'all have any other questions or comments? Right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, let it be noted by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries 7-0. Uh, all right, we are now moving on to commission comments. <coughs> uh, Commissioner Delgado. Thank you. First, I want to welcome the new uh, Derek Feature and say that welcome aboard. I, I don't know if we were going to do it formally or not, but I wanted to welcome you aboard and, uh, you know, welcome. And you hit the ground running and without much fanfare, but we're excited to have you here and looking forward to great things. So welcome. Um, and obviously you came at the end of an exciting weekend, so that was quite the weekend to welcome you to Daytona Beach. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all of Orlando came out to say hi to you, and you were nowhere to be found. So. The chief kept me off beachside. <laughs> well, that's why they were all there. That was the big show. They were looking for you. Um, yeah, that was, a, that was a, a very stressful weekend, and I think our police force did a great job managing it. Um, you know, obviously, I think they were forewarned about it, and I know that there were a lot of police officers. I think maybe most of the department seemed like it was out in force. I mean, I saw high-ranking people at the stop signs and all up and down. So, um, you know, I think there was maybe one or two uh, serious incidents, but for the most part, we did a really good job of controlling and containing that situation. So on behalf of my neighborhood area and all that, we really appreciate that. It was uh, much better than it had been in previous years. So we want to thank you for doing that. Um, obviously, now we know that's kind of a recurring mm -hmm. event, and it seemed that was the intersection of several different events. Um, the shutting down of the beach was, I mean, a good tactical move. I think it was necessary. I think there were some people that were caught off guard by that. Um, so I don't know if in the future if that's going to be a recurring thing, maybe advertise that in advance so um, you know the people can make their plans as I got several complaints from people that, that they were trapped in traffic for a long period of time and stuff like that but it really can't be helped I mean probably better that you be way late in traffic than you have rioting or anything else that could have gone on so um, and lastly on a personal note um, people have been asking me my house I have a for sale sign outside my house I'm not getting a divorce I'm not dying <laughs> as far as I know 
Um, I guess I'm not getting a divorce as far as I know either. Um, everything is perfectly wonderful and fine in my life as far as I know. I'm still a resident of Daytona Beach. I'm still a resident of Zone 2. And even if my house sells, I am still a resident of Zone 2 by virtue of my other um, properties and things like that. So I'm not going anywhere. You guys don't get rid of me that easily. You have to deal with that in two years. But I know there have been some concern and some people had asked questions, so I just want to be very upfront. I don't generally like to talk about my private life, but because that seemed like something that people were asking me, I wanted to be transparent about that. And again, it's not motivated by anything other than I have young kids and my wife and I would like to explore different options as far as where we raise our kids as opposed to being directly on a river in Halifax, which is not a place you want to let your four-year-old try to learn to bike or anything like that, given that people rush by there all given time. So that's all it is, nothing more, nothing less. And I have every intention of continuing to be a resident of Daytona Beach in Zone 2 as long as I'm an elected city commissioner. So that's all I have. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, you normally don't do that, uh, but let's, um, while we're on the topic of the beach side, um, let's ask the chief if he wants to sort of address that, because um, the one concern that I did have is as it relates to people who live over there, and I, I did ask the city attorney, we'd have some discussion, but I'll let you talk about your plan. Um, Good evening, Commission. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Mr. Manager. So to say the least, we had a very interesting weekend on the beach side. We had uh, multiple events scheduled for Saturday. Um, we had the concert series on the band shell. We had a block party on Main Street. And then we had the unsanctioned event of Orlando invades Daytona. So I brought all of my resources in at noon. And we had a mass briefing at the Ocean Center at noon, and I asked those officers to do three things. And I'm very proud of them because they did all three. I asked them to pack their patience, pack their professionalism, and above all, do not panic. Because I had a feeling once uh, the Orlando and Bay's Daytona crowd started to come into town, which they did later in the afternoon, and then some of the other uh, patrons started to come in town for the other events, it was going to get a little bit chaotic. Um, so we coordinated with Beach Patrol, and at about 4 o'clock, the Beach Patrol made the decision based on overcrowding on the beach, and then they had a couple of disturbances on the beach. They made the decision to close the beach to all non-residents. So that was their decision, but I took up a position on the roof of the Hilton Hotel uh, South Tower so I could see all of Atlantic Avenue. I could see what was coming off of the beach onto the hard top. I could also see the bridges. So just looking at all of that, what was coming off of the beach as well as what was coming over to the beach side at the same time, we made the decision um, for public safety to just go ahead and shut off eastbound coming over while they dumped uh, while they dumped off of the beach onto Atlantic Avenue. Also, I received some law enforcement sensitive information uh, that there was some stuff out there on social media, uh, some folks that were coming into town, they were on the way, advertised it being on the way, and they were toting firearms. So when I saw that, that confirmed my decision that we were going to hold the bridges to make sure that those folks never reached their final destination of Atlantic Avenue because if we remember last year, we made national media. So my goal was not on my watch. We're not going to make national media this year. So I would rather have some of our local residents upset because they were delayed than to deal with what could have happened. Because if we remember last year, we had a shooting with two people shot, non-life-threatening injuries, and then we also had a pursuit in the South End neighborhood, the South End Lenox Park neighborhood, all within the span of an hour. And I felt like, you know, we always do an after-action report or an after-action study of what we could have done differently or what we could have done better. And that was one thing I said, you know what, if had we cut off those bridges once it got to a certain point, we probably could have avoided those incidents. So that was the decision that I made based on on what I saw, and I have to tell you, um, there used to be a time when folks would see a police car, marked police car with flashing lights, and they would say, you know what, I'm not sure what's going on, but I thank you for protecting me for any potential hurt, harm, and danger. Those days are over. 
Because when they saw that, people just, they got very, very upset. I'll put it to you that way. Um, so one thing I know I can do better and that I will do moving forward is make sure I notify all of you that that decision has been made because I probably could have saved myself half a dozen incoming phone calls once, that, once the bridges went on lockdown because everybody, of course, wanted to know what was going on. So I've already committed to memory that moving forward, if I have to make a decision like that, I'll just send out a mass text, say, hey, heads up, this is why we're doing this. You know, I could fill you guys in later in detail, but I'm making this decision, you know, out of an abundance of caution. Um, secondly, well, moving forward, next, not this weekend, but next weekend, we have the trucks rolling back into town, truck meet. So I feel like this past weekend was almost like a dry run for what we're going to be dealing with next weekend, which is June 10th, 11th, 12th, and the 13th. And from what I've been told, this one is probably going to be the largest one that we've seen. Folks are making up for lost time now that things are opened up, and this one is going to be big. So what we're doing is we've canceled days off for all of our resources for next weekend. So I have my full contingency of officers. We've also reached out for mutual aid from the sheriff's office and surrounding agencies. And the, the big thing, the most important thing is I want to go back to the old school uh, parking permit system or the, the access system where we used to have the pink P. And what we want to do is I want to designate the Main Street Bridge for residents, business owners, uh, public safety officials, and of course, city officials. So everybody will get a, a pass and we're going to distribute them from both the beachside precinct as well as the main station. So all anyone would have to do is come in and show their ID ahead of time and they'll get their pink pass and we'll hold the main street bridge just for those folks, for residents, business owners, and, you know, public safety personnel, city officials, you know, so on and so forth. And that way, it should alleviate what happened this past weekend. Because that wasn't the goal. We, you know, I never want to inconvenience our residents. But again, I just did that out of an abundance of caution. And I think going back to what we used to do in our BCR days, I think it worked well. And I think that is a, I think that's a, a great compromise. May. I asked a question about this, please. So a lot of hotels, so explain to me how this impacts the hotels and their guests with the, pot, with the pink pass. How does this work for them? Well, for them, you still have, well, during the day, all bridges will be open. Like around check-in time, all of those bridges will be open. But once we get to a certain point and we're watching the other bridges, because it, I think it'll work now primarily because we finally have the Orange Avenue bridge back open. So you have Orange Avenue Bridge, you have Speedway Bridge, and you still have the Seabreeze Bridge. Most people coming in town from out of town, they only know one way. They get on Speedway and they stay on Speedway and they go over that bridge. So that's the plan. Okay, and then the thing we discussed in addition to texting everybody, which I really appreciate that I was fielding a lot of phone calls from people on Beachside and then calling businesses also. Um, I'm wondering if we have some way we can notify residents. So I recognize that we don't know when these invasions are going to take place, right. but to have any kind of communication system that does not involve the resident researching for themselves. Yes, thank you. I left that part off. Yeah. Um, we're going to do a better job with messaging. I do have a public information officer, and moving forward, every event, he's going to be in my back pocket. He's going to be out with me, so <laughs> when I start noticing things, he can stay on top of sending out messages, and we do that via all of our social media outlets, and we do it through our police department app. But, so, but do we have a, like a, we need, and I don't know if we have this, a texting system, um, even if we had to pay for it, where we text all of our residents who live in Daytona Beach yeah. that this is what's going on. There, uh, yeah. And they have programs like that. There's a company in Ormond that I think does that with law enforcement where they can blast text everyone, or we could just have like an opt in, like text mm -hmm. pound Daytona and get alerts yeah. or something. Like right. That. What? Do we have a system like that yet? No. I'm not sure, but that's something I can look into. I think we may have something that will work. But I, let, let me look into it. I, look into do you anticipate the, the pink P system being in place for this? 
this, yes. this weekend. For, no, no, next weekend. Not this yeah, weekend, sorry. next um, weekend. So I want to blast out all advertisement mm -hmm. starting tomorrow. Thank you. Mr. Oh. Manager, you have a comment? Yeah, one of the concerted efforts that we're planning on making after conversations with the chief, but also with our communications team, is trying to find that particular system, how we all, all three or four of us together, work to make sure that one, once something goes out, it goes on all of our social media platforms, our website, and finding a link, probably utilizing the police department's new app that a person could go on there if they have access to that app. They always know when there's updates coming on if we can't get a system in place to alert people who sign up for a text. Are we involved with the neighborhood, um, the, the, the neighborhood apps? Are we involved with them at all? Do we yeah, put out information? Because those are very good. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. that, that's included in, in our social media outlet. Mm -hmm. okay. And then the other thing is, you know, in the event that we have someone that, let's say, someone's getting a late delivery and, a, and the delivery truck needs to get over, it's, it's all about just having the right person there with common sense. They may not have the pink pee, but they're legitimately going over to make a delivery, they'll be, they'll be allowed access over as well. Okay. Foreman uses so. something called Code Red, which is a, a system that you can opt into and they text you for weather alerts and all that. But I, I know that that's what they use. I've even gotten phone calls <coughs> from Orman, like there's someone missing or whatever. So I think Code Red is the company that, and they're mm. on Orman Beach, the ministers. Mm. That'd be great if you have the ability to like send a message out to everybody. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. We'll be working on it uh, first thing in the morning. Appreciate it, thank you. Yeah, we have that at the university too. All right. Thank you. Anything else? I believe that was okay. it. Great job. Uh, we were safe. That's your first job. I think we all lead a results-oriented life, and I woke up the next day, and I saw they had a mass casualty incident in Miami. I said, you know, pray for the victims, but I want to do what I could for my 68.1 square miles here in <laughs> Daytona Beach to make sure we didn't look like what happened in Miami. And we appreciate your guys giving up the weekends and vacation time and all that. That doesn't should not go unsaid. That we appreciate the sacrifice. They that's made. that's what we sign up for. They know when they sign up to work here. We're an event-oriented town, so. Still. But yeah, I think I think everybody did a great job, and I was very pleased with the outcome overall. I'll just make sure again to make make my notifications on the front end. Appreciate it. And and as you said, and I say this to the residents. Um, the unfortunate reality is when you get a, you get an event one time, it's one time. But now, every Memorial Day, I would say that we can uh, uh, anticipate this. And ahead of time, we should say in social media, expect an invasion, or what they refer to as an invasion, mm -hmm. so that no one can say that we're surprised anymore by it. Right. Uh, and, you know, I read a lot of things and I ignore a lot of things in social media, but the reality is we are an events town and people are going to want to come here and they have a right to come here. Uh, and, you know, we're not going to be in the business of discouraging people, uh, but we're going to be in the business of trying to be safe and creating an environment that just makes it wholesome and, and successful for everyone. Uh, but I do think that, that that's something that I, we need to remember next year to all blast it out and say we can expect that even if they haven't promoted it a day before because these young people can promote it in six to 12 hours. Uh -huh. It takes them, they can, they can literally do that and get people here. So again, mm -hmm. thank you. Oh, last thing, just to, just to add to that is I think a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of our residents, they don't realize that we actually vet several of these events throughout the year. This one on Memorial Day seems to be the one that draws the biggest crowd, but we actually, we have to monitor it continuously throughout the year because there's been several takeover <coughs> style events that have popped up mm -hmm. and they fizzled out and they've turned out to be nothing. So that was a stern conversation I had to have with my staff this week too. Like we can't just focus on the number of shares and try to guess at how many people are coming to town. So now we know now we've established a pattern because it was big last year, it was big this year, so just like you said, we know if no other one, the Memorial Day weekend, that's a big one, so we need to staff up and do what we need to do. So I envision moving forward, um, Memorial Day weekend, I'll, my staffing will look like the truck meet will next week. Um, 
I have a question, sir. Is it possible, I'm, I know we did this on uh, parts of Zone 3 uh, during the last truck event, I requested it, where we had blocked off the drive-through roads, the cut-through roads. Are we yep. doing that a little bit further down in Zone 2 also on the beach side? Or we can. We, uh, okay. I have to go back and look at the ops plan to I make sure we have, because sure. you know we have all of our neighborhood intrusion. Right. So we coordinate and, and we block off certain things to sure. avoid them running through the neighborhood. So, so uh, Captain Lee and I were at a neighborhood meeting in Zone 3 about a month ago, I want to say, or Zone 2, sorry, about a month ago, and the residents were discussing traffic going through. But I appreciate you doing that for Zone 3 on Beachside especially, because it's terrible. And then I'll be straight with you, people are going into residential parking lots or apartment parking lots. And what they're doing in there is not the best thing from a hygiene perspective. And so this is why it's important they notify us just to have restrooms available or portalettes, something like this. You know, it would be great. All right, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Quick question. Uh, when you talk about the pink passes for uh, residents, is that residents of Daytona in general or will it just be residents of the beach it was side? It was beach side residents. But... Uh, so, for instance, the calls that I got were from um, hotel workers that work on this side but need to get back and forth on the beach side. They'll be included. They qualify, there. yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. I just wanted to make sure it was clear on the record because I had so many phone calls, and I was over there as <laughs> well, stuck in traffic. It was not a protest. It was young kids having a good time and enjoying the beach because it, I had so many phone calls saying protest. Yeah, it was it was definitely not a protest and that was the other reason that we went ahead and we shut down traffic on Atlantic Avenue because when I looked at what was coming off of the beach onto the hard top, I already knew it was going to spill over onto Atlantic Avenue because it was just that many. So I said we need to cut traffic northbound on A1A at Speedway because I knew once that push came up onto the hard top, it was going to spill over into Atlantic Avenue. So that was part of that was part of the plan. And I just asked them, said, let's just do a slow, methodical push, and eventually we'll get everybody back to their cars. So the end result, we didn't tear gas anybody, we didn't dog bite anybody, Great. we didn't do any of that. It was just Great a job. slow, consistent push. Mm -hmm. Great job. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Very good job. Thank you. Thank you, Team Daytona. Uh, Commissioner Delgado, anything else? No, sir, thank you. Sir. Okay, thank you. Commissioner May? Uh, so a few things this evening. First of all, I spoke with um, our dear friend, Miss Linda McGee. I had a conversation with her, and she was reminding me about the June 16th event that's coming up. But I was, with the conversation we had a was about the great need of food that still exists in the Daytona Beach community. And I thought we were working toward that end and apparently the need continues. So if there are people who are doing food, and I see Reverend Magala in the room with us here, so I appreciate Alan Chapel always doing things in the community and other churches also. Um, there's a couple called uh, Pastor Victor Miles and his wife, Danelle Miles, and they apparently have given out over 10,000, um, they've served over 10,000 residents and families in the Daytona Beach area, and they continue to do it once a month. But just a... Uh, uh, just a thought for us to keep in mind, there's still people who need some help. I'd like to know, with regard, I keep promoting the rental assistance program because I think it's fantastic. How much funds is left in that rental assistance program? Because it allows us to help people with their rent if they've been impacted by COVID. So do we know how much money is left that we can still hand out if people need it? I would hate to send them to a resource that no longer exists. We had an email just this week mm -hmm. that highlighted it. Who, who can answer? Can anyone answer? Mr. Morris. Mr. Morris? I don't know the number. You should have asked. My, my recollection, Please. Chairman, member, is that uh, roughly 300000 left with the expected additional money from CARES funds that are coming. Mr. Gooden, I'll get you a specific answer to the entire committee mm -hmm. and the manager tomorrow for Mr. Gooden. It'll be down to the dollar. And so just so what we have as well as what we expect. Sure. I'm not sure if you know, but I know the, but could you please describe to us if people, again, just briefly, because I know people are listening at home, if you've been impacted by COVID, work, um, time, illness, et cetera. So we've got staff to take phone calls, deal with people, help them do the work they need to do or fill out the materials they need to fill out in order to qualify and come to the assistance. And we've got a work room up here in the front so people can come in the lobby to the extent they need face-to-face -face help or help over the phone. So there's two folks working with Mr. Gooden to 
take care of that. We've got other two other people that have advanced to other positions that are also available to fill in and help. So we have the staff, have mm -hmm. the means, and we'll be moving forward. And we also have the Central Florida Community Development Corp, the Housing Authority, the Mid Florida Housing Partnership. They're also working with us to this end, I believe. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So the max is three thousand dollars over two over two months. That I can't tell you. It is. It's $3,000 over two months. And so if you are eligible, what kind of documentation, do you have any idea you would need to provide? Let's say I, I was I have ill or... Work. We can give some, we'll have an itemized list and I can actually get you additional information so that you can distribute it all the Yes. Uh -huh. We'll have that in an email to you tomorrow. Okay. All right. Thank you. And it is, mm -hmm. it, it, we have it. Mm -hmm. We have it. Mm -hmm. We have it, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. We've been doing it. Mm -hmm. And it's just so everybody can know. And exactly. Get more itemized information while other folks are listening. Mm -hmm. But they can call here. Mr. Gooden's office is there, and it's in the uh, permits and li permits and licensing in city, and we'll work our way through it. Mm -hmm. We've got folks to help. I have a question. And are we advertising? I'm sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Along those same lines, are we advertising this information on our mm -hmm. website? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I noticed in our last, our most recent water bill, there was a nice little flyer that was talking about some of the city information. Is was that something that was on there? I can't recall. It was a two-pager. I, I don't know one way or another, ma'am. That might be something that we want to advertise mm -hmm. as well. It will all be answered to you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And so I appreciate the fact that we have the information and we try to share it among the community members we know, but I'm also realizing that as I have conversations and I tell people, no, we do have help for you, we are doing something for you, they still aren't completely aware of it. I think you have to be completely desperate and then reaching out for help before you realize it, but maybe we can do a little bit better job communicating the information. Um, then I have a... Um, I have a definitional question for Mr. Jagger, please. Mr. Jagger, we have a concept called functional family homes. I would like for you to please describe to me the first, tell me and define the term for the community. Then I'd like you to describe the impact of the phrase functional family homes to all of the city, please. All right, well, let me, uh, let me start with uh, how this definition came to be. Uh, last year, there were some revisions made to your code, your old land development code, uh, to provide for reasonable accommodations to persons who are seeking exceptions to your zoning code and have disabilities. So we revised the code to provide for a process, which we had never had before, uh, to receive applications and provide uh, those exceptions. Um, as part of that, uh, we had done some house cleaning to the code as well. And one of those housekeeping matters was to revise the definition of family. So uh, you'll recall when that came forward, there was a lot of discussion about um, what a traditional family is, what a non-traditional family is. And, and the reason the definition of family is significant is because we use it throughout the code to determine you know, what belongs in a single family residential house um, for zoning purposes. So um, when this came to you, um, we already had a definition of family. It involved uh, one or more persons related by law, blood, marriage. Uh, that did not change. Um, we had a, um, a maximum number of two unrelated persons. That changed to three. And then out of that conversation, um, there was discussion of uh, dorm living, uh, non-related persons living together uh, as a family unit. Um, Un unofficially adopted children living uh, within a family setting. And so we came up with the definition for what is a functional family. And um, I did bring this with me tonight because I thought you might mention okay. it. You can, you can, um, so a functional family uh, for purposes of our code okay. is uh, a group of unrelated persons that are in a nonprofit setting um, which meet two criteria. Um, they function as a single housekeeping unit. And uh, secondarily, they are a permanent and stable group. And there are elements laid out into the code as, as to how those, uh, what factors are to be considered. So the, the point here, and really for all of our definitional matters, is you want to treat like groups in a similar way. So if a, if a type of use uh, is regulated, um, all those similar types should be regulated in the exact same way. So for instance, if you allow a, a type of business in, in uh, zoning districts, you would look at the impact on the area and you would relate and you would regulate all similar businesses in that same way. A huge um, problem in certain parts of zone three that relates to residences, many people living in one home. And so many people living in a single family home 
if they said that they were a functional family, then this would be okay. If they met the definition mm -hmm. of a functional family, that would be within your code. Is there any idea of how long they have to live in the, in the home together? So remember, any single family home in any part of the city can now be considered a functional family home, and you can have multiple people living in this home. Is that correct? Again, if, if they meet the definition. So it's not meant for transitional groups. So a functional family, by definition, uh, is, <coughs> is not a temporary or a seasonal association. What is the length of time? There's no stated length of time, but uh, certainly if there were a code violation, that would be a matter for the magistrate or the code board to determine if they've met the definition. Okay, so I'm going to leave that out here for a second. The next thing I want to bring up is the trash issues that I'm having in certain parts of Zone 3. I can only speak to Zone 3, but I think it's an issue we're having in other parts of the city as well. I don't attribute this to WastePro, nor do I say that code enforcement is doing a poor job. What I am suggesting is that we are finding things like dressers and mattresses being put out on the sidewalks in certain parts of town on irregular. It's not like it's every 1st, every 15th on the 30th. It's just different days of the week, which makes it really hard. So I field a lot of phone calls, as does the mayor, I think he was mentioning uh, last time. He feels a lot. We feel a lot of phone calls about the situation. So I guess I'm, I'm wondering if the functional family home concept could, is there a room for it to be abused? Is there space for it to be abused, or is it a tight enough definition that we're not having people temporarily moving into single-family homes? And I'm going to say this. Even though it's happening in Zone 3, this could happen all over Daytona Beach, as a matter of fact, not just Zone 3. So do we have anything that can help the neighbors of the situation? I, I can't really speak to whether the uh, regulations are being abused in any way. That is a question for code enforcement or for law enforcement, if they've got if they're experiencing problems in the community. Um, I'm not aware of that. So um, perhaps someone's here that can speak to that. Okay, as it relates to trash, I will say that um, to be aware of, if we are receiving, and I went over this with the city manager today, if we're receiving multiple complaints on properties that are being built, so it's not that we are not doing anything. Code enforcement is working very hard, but it seems, and I love some input, as hard as we're working on it, more things keep happening. And so I'm not going to say it's code enforcement. And it's not the people who are present listening. It's not the people who are trying to help the community. It's the people who aren't. So if there are any cities that have come up with ways that you can help the people who are not actually helping the rest of us, I would be open to listening to that. All right? So, um, so they are being built. So I don't want you to think they're not being penalized in some way. They are being built. If we're doing chronic pickup at different times, they are getting a bill for it. So I will say that I had a very pleasant and productive meeting today uh, with the city manager. And I had it with uh, Mr. Jagger and Mr. Morris was there and Ms. Betty Goodman was there. And what I appreciated most about the experience was that we were dealing with policy ways of dealing with policy, different issues that were relevant to Zone 3, and different ways that we could help each other. And I appreciated um, the shared experience today. Thank you. I'm really looking forward to spending some time with you next week. And I mean that sincerely. I left the meeting going, huh, okay then. I feel as though some of the issues I brought up pertaining to Beachside, Mr. Nicholson, especially sidewalks on Beachside, I'm paying attention to them, um, trash, code enforcement, I feel as though we're moving in a very good direction right now. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Commissioner uh, Cantu. Yeah, I just had a couple of things. One was I'm bringing up the cell phone towers again on the west side. I'm receiving a lot of calls and I'm very worried about emergency calls, hurricane alerts. They're having really a hard time with reception. Um, I know that I brought it up a couple meetings ago and I was told that I have the property, but I need to find something. I called some friends in Tallahassee. I do have AT&T, um, I believe T-Mobile, a couple that are on board. And AT&T was already on their alert and they're gonna speed it up. Um, I put them in touch with um, Mr. Morris and he had a few people he was able to contact. So could you give us an update of what's happening? 
Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Jim Morris, Deputy City Manager. In respect to the subject raised, uh, typically what you have is cell tower constructors. They, they build the site, they lease space to various providers. So there's an ability to put towers out to the west and provide additional service. And actually the city had one site that was approved and ultimately not developed. The city now has 32 acres of property that fronts on LPGA. There's land donated as a result of non-payment of taxes. It fronts on LPGA, it's adjacent to the golf course, it has a good central location for a tower that should be able to be constructed at a height of 180 to 200 feet above grade. So it's also a property that could potentially be used for a park. That's a different subject altogether, but a tower can be located in such a way it doesn't interfere with the site. The two cell tower contractors that I knew about came over, did an evaluation. They had slightly different opinions in regard to the towers needed to provide current population service as well as future population. If you think of cell towers almost as an umbrella, there is, in other words, if you had a bunch of umbrellas in a room, each have an umbrella touching. They kind of work that way in terms of the signal area that they can handle. They also have loading characteristics, which had a numerical point, and it depends on the tower, also the height. They're loaded to the point they can't really function further, so additional service is needed. On those towers, then providers locate their antennas and receivers and so on to service their particular customer. So each company, AT&T, whatever, all the others, would have a site on the tower for the type of construction that we're talking about. So these contractors both indicated there would be a willingness to build a tower in that vicinity in order to provide space that could serve the area and help to cure the issues. Uh, I did have a conversation with the AT&T regional representative that Commissioner Cantu had called me. They already did have it located as far as the interest in their place and knowing that there's a deficiency in service. They're aware of dropped calls and lack of service and depending on how we work as we work to the north towards State Road 40, there may be additional cell towers needed as both numbers and distance grow. But uh, pursuant to Mr. Chisholm's direction prior to Mr. Fiatcher coming on board, uh, this purchasing department has been told to write bid specifications so someone can set up to provide a cell tower site on the 32 acres at front on LPGA. And that tower would initially, presuming it's built, provide a cure to some of the service issues and there may be another tower necessary to be located further to the north and slightly to the east in order to provide service. Contractors and there's radio studies and so on that will be done to meet that need, but there apparently is a willingness for providers to come and construct a tower and then market that to the, when I say a provider, I mean a cell tower provider, provide space to cell service providers to locate on the tower. So we have, we've had the inquiry, we've had interest, and we're actually having uh, bid specifications for an FP prepared and purchasing uh, even as we speak. All right. Sounds good. I would like to get a little bit of information there succinctly sent to me for my talk I have to have with some people. I, uh, just I just one paragraph. That's you'll have, you'll have it tomorrow. Yeah. A question for yeah, you. Yeah, I know. You know, it, it will be. It'll, be. it'll be there tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, my final thing is um, Climores, it's, it's kind of hard that road is about sidewalks. Some is counties, some is um, state, and it's, it's difficult. And I, I thought I had all that repaired, that sidewalk from um, Bevel Road all the way to Big Tree. Well, I got a, received a call from a professor, professor at Embry-Riddle today, and there's still a little gap. And actually, it's um, F dot, and it's I think around a thousand feet. And I talked to Mr. Morris, and he thinks that there's something we can do because we really need that little gap filled for the Embry-Riddle students to that ride their bikes and walk. And could you? explain what we can do with Mayor Commission Jim Morris deputy manager I'll tell you what I believe we can do <clears throat> you know Riddle built sidewalk along Clyde Morris in the section that they are most interested in Clyde Morris is a state road and Riddle was able to get permission from DOT to pay for and construct the sidewalk uh, Rodney Cruz at Riddle was the primary person there that moved that project along the city also notified FDOT that they had no objection to Riddle's proposal, and you know now that walkway is there. It's very nice. The section Commissioner Cantu is talking about is a smaller section, narrower section, and so on. 
And I believe that if we follow the same model that Riddle used to construct the section that they did along Clyde Morris further to the north, that we could use the same model for this section of walkway, which is a fairly short section. And I was just mentioning to Mr. Holmes about it because we hadn't had a chance to talk about it, but I think that would be the way to address that if the commission is so inclined. Um, I, I think I, it's fairly straightforward. I have no objection to that. I mean, it sounds like something that needs to be done. Um, no one else has any objection, then go for it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And that's it. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Henry. couple things tonight. Uh, on June 12th, we're having the dedication of the Norma J. Bland football and soccer field. Uh, quick question on that. I know that um, previous city manager said that the scoreboard had already been approved for that the, and put in the budget. And I wanted to know if that scoreboard had been put up and if it will be there for the, for the dedication ceremony. I don't think it's been put up, but if um, Keith is here, I think he can communicate. Hello, Hi. sir. Keith Willis, Leisure Service Director. Um, we've already ordered it, but it has not been put up yet. Okay, so it has been ordered. Okay, a uh, quick question, another question while you're standing there. So, the Pop Warner and the teams that will sh be sharing those two fields, uh, will it be set up that two programs can use those fields in one day, or will we be running different programs simultaneously, like the soccer and the football? Uh, what are our plans for using, how are we going to utilize both of those fields? We tried to get the, um, <coughs> to just say the Bucks to play two games at one time, but the problem is officials, um, the officials don't want to drive from wherever they're, they're scheduled to do the games and do like three games. They want to do all the games from the first team until the last team, which is at night. So, um, but then I think we're going to have a problem with parking if we have two different associations come out, the Bucks and the uh, Pride or whatever. I don't think we can do two games at one time unless it's the one organization. So uh, what will be the purpose of the other field? How are we going to utilize that then? For practice. That's what we originally had for practice, for soccer. Um, and um, So we can teams. do soccer if we choose to do soccer, because I know they run simultaneously well, and flag football. Correct. So the city will still be able to, because our crowd won't be as big, we'll be able to still use both fields simultaneously. Correct. I just wanted, I was, was concerned and and asking about ways that we could save on electricity of running those big lights at nighttime um, for those football programs, because I know it's expensive to run those. I don't, I think the lights don't come on until probably around October 6, 536. Okay. Um, and that's probably the last game. So, okay. All right. Thank you. Congratulations on the graduation of your son. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, on June 7th, I don't know if I said this, you can come to the Neighborhood Watch at Living Faith Church at 7 o'clock, and you're going to be able to meet our uh, new city manager, and that will be Monday at 7. Uh, I like to invite everyone out to, now he's not going to be answering any questions, he's just going to be there so that you all can meet him in, in, in a small meet and greet. <laughs> so you can't go throwing all your questions on him and your concerns on him just yet, but you'll be able to come out and say hello if you're in the, in the area. Um, also, just wanted to say that uh, I did meet with the city manager, Mr. Morris, for a while, city attorney, and and Ms. Goodman as well today, and it was very positive and b very productive, and uh, I felt like uh, my ideas were heard and that, uh, that uh, some of the things that I would like to see happen in the zone are, are going to come into fruition, so I was very excited about that. Last thing is the is the sidewalks. So I have been wanting those sidewalks and, and asking about those sidewalks for years, and 
I am so just, I'm, I'm very excited and happy that we will be having those sidewalks coming close to, what, $800,000 project, a big deal for that zone. I don't know if you all remembered a few years ago when the young man got hit because we didn't have sidewalks and we didn't have lights over there. Um, and so I think that this is really going to make the connection for the Derbyshire Park to the Yvonne Scarlet Center and make it very cohesive and very community and user friendly. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to see that. Uh, also, just last question, which is the new scoreboard at the stadium, is it an all digital scoreboard? I know it's a, the, the clock is added to what we already had, right? Oh, I know Keith is like, oh, it's just up there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, the new scoreboard, is it all digital? Um, so everything on it can be changed for different schools and because I see it says home of the BCU Wildcats. And it says MEAC and they've changed to the SWAC. So I just want to make sure it's Yeah, I, I do think in, in the brief conversation that Keith is coming, I think that the university is going to um, – change the MEAC component to SWAC, right, Correct. at their dime. Yes. Um, and the, but the, the digital components as far as the, the it's, it's not going to change out to different school names. No, it won't. No? Okay. That's the Jumbotron. We need. The right. Jumbotron, Jumbotron is actually down yeah. right now. We're evaluating how that can be put back up finding partners because it is a very um, large mm -hmm. expense. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, last thing is um, just wanted to say that um, I got calls about uh, people who worked on the beach side but lived on the mainland, and so I'm glad that our police chief has done a good job of uh, addressing that issue and making sure in the next uh, phase of, of our activities that those issues will be addressed because uh, we have lots of... Uh, workers that need to get back and forth. And a lot of our workers use Uber and Lyft and, and those types of things. So just want to make sure that they're going to be able to get to work and from work because they don't have transportation. Um, transportation is a real issue for some of um, for many of our residents. Uh, and, and thank the chief for doing a, a fantastic job on just making sure that the residents were safe, making good calls, um, and trying to be fair and balanced while doing it. And that's all my comments for tonight. Thank you. All right, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Reed. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. I too would like to, um, I don't know why my voice is like this. <coughs> <coughs> is it sexy? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't spoken much today. <coughs> but I too would like to welcome our new city manager, Mr. Fiacher. That's all practice, fee <laughs> And um, I, too, had a good meeting with Mr. fee and with our attorney and with Ms. Goodman. And um, I also look forward to uh, new things coming. And in regards to a meet and greet, the Midtown Community Development Corporation is inviting the city to come to the Dickerson Center on June 10th and to meet him. There will be a welcome reception, as well as he will address a few questions or just share his vision and that is on June 10th at 6 p.m. at the John H. Dickerson Center. I'd like to say, um, you know, it's not often, Mr. Mayor, that I have to replace you or substitute for you, but I was really grateful this past week that I, I stood in your stead at the um, home of the Bulldogs, Turity Small, uh, in regards to Officer Willie Ann Chirillo. If you all saw in the news, Officer Chirillo single-handedly took down a, um, a robber. Chief accompanied me there. Why does Delgado still want to play taps? Oh, it's, it's, it's Memorial Day was Monday. I don't know why keeps ringing. It's on silent. I don't know why it's doing that. I don't time. either. <laughs> but Officer Chirillo single-handedly took down a robber and had the school shut down, and the children gave her a little parade of appreciation. She's our resource officer that is that is um, stationed there. And I, this is a childhood friend of mine, so I was able to tell those young people that this was a, a friend of mine from their age and how she uh, became a police explorer, that she became a communications person for the police department, and now ultimately she's a police officer, and her daughter is one as well. So I was really pleased to be able to do that and to recognize her for that. 
Then also, I want to tell you, um, Commissioner May and, and others, in regards to food on the third Thursday of every month at the um, New Life Church that Pastor Gooden is, the senior pastor, that the Divine Nine, which are the nine um, organizations, uh, Greek, Black Greek organizations, gather as well as other churches, and we give free food on every third Thursday at that church. Have a current resource list for that at all that we know of? I don't have a resource list of whom all is giving food. I just know that we do it every third Thursday. I appreciate so knowing that. So we can that. start with that and then perhaps just continue to ask I'm who sure. else is doing it and, and provide a list it, to the citizens. What time is it, please? It starts at 10 a.m. Thank you. And you have the other guy that you just mentioned, Pastor Miles. Yes. You, mm -hmm. you have his time. Uh, you, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it upon myself to put together a listing of as many places that I can find. So if anybody is doing that, please reach out, contact me, and I'll put something together and then distribute it to you. Great. And I'll provide something for you regarding that. And then lastly, uh, you all, I would like to, to commend Mr. Darrell Black on his second Malcolm X Day. I know we were all concerned about some of the talent that was coming. I really believe the talent didn't come. Uh, that we were concerned about. But you know, when I first took the seat, one of the concerns I had for the citizens that I represented was that nothing happens in Midtown. There's no activity, no events, or what have you. And I made it clear that if nothing happened, that I would start something myself. And I began the Community Unity Festival, and then we had a seafood festival, which I would like to continue in the coming year. Um, however, Mr. Black is a community person, a young man, who's striving to do something. And I know we still got to kind of coach him a little bit. But this event was spectacular. He had the, the park, Daisy Stocking Park, was full, full of vendors, full of families. Even our new manager came by to check it out. And um, we gave out several different things. Um, and it was just really a beautiful day. And um, there was no complaints that I heard of. And I think um, we need just to continue to support our young people because they are our future. So, Commissioner Reed, in the future, if you have events that you want to partner with me with in Midtown, I would absolutely love to do something, especially around the MMB area. Mm -hmm. I was actually thinking, we were speaking earlier, I was thinking about trying to put on um, something, okay, I'm going to say it, hot dog base. I don't eat hot dogs, nor do I eat bread. However, everyone else loves hot dogs, <laughs> and they love bread, and they love ketchup, and they love lemonade. Mm -hmm. So, if there was a... If if you knew of somebody, I was thinking maybe Mr. Um, Mr. Rel Black, maybe you'd want would like to do something for us, or any other nonprofit who wants to do something like that for July Fourth. Mm -hmm. If you want to partner with me, if you know of anybody, let me know. Okay. I would love to help and provide some funds for that. Well, we mm -hmm. have a parade on the fourth. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would morning. like to know if there's maybe even if we do it a day before, a day after, just mm -hmm. in that community for people, just to celebrate the Fourth of July. Mm -hmm. Let's give it some thought. Perhaps our new manager will have some ideas as well. See how I threw that back on him? <laughs> I think she already has an idea. I just have to get with Keith and um, uh -huh. Morris. All right. That, that concludes my comments. Good evening. <laughs> Thank you. Commissioner Traeger. Okay. I'd like to congratulate Mr. Fiatcher on his new job. And I'd like to congratulate the city of Daytona Beach for getting Mr. Fiatcher on this new job. All right. <laughs> the Halifax Historical Museum has an exhibit right now about our fire department. It'll be running through um, November or till November, I'm not sure which. Um, Mr. Driscoll, I think, would be able to tell us a little bit more about it, maybe, if he gets a chance. Would you? Thank you. Uh, yes, Commissioner Traeger. Uh, currently, the Daytona Beach Fire Department was honored by the Halifax Historical Society um, with the inclusion of a uh, quite the exhibit. It features five different exhibit boxes. If you've ever been to the museum, it's, it's worth the trip. Um, it's celebrating our history extending back to 1898 when we first formed as Daytona Fire Department up until 1925 when we became Daytona Beach Fire Department at our new home at 301 South Beach. Uh, it is well worth a visit, and I believe I am supposed to give a speaking engagement to the society board at some time in the near future um, at Fane's request. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, the museum is located at 252 South Beach Street. If anybody would like to come by and see it. 
And also, I'd like to offer my congratulations to Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University Worldwide announced the graduation of Denzel Sykes with the degree of Master of Science with a major in leadership with distinction. He is one of our staff members, and I couldn't be more pleased. And uh, I wish him congratulations, and I'm sure we all do. Nice. That's it. Yeah. Great, great job. Yeah. Okay. Um, bridges. We've uh, heard from a litany of uh, community organizations um, about mainly the Seabreeze Bridge and the need to have it uh, pressure cleaned. Um, and I know that we're in the process of beginning to figure out how much that will cost and how we can get that done. So I look forward to that. I do think that it is something that, that we need to focus on because um, in my beachside meetings, uh, with the group that I've been meeting with, I would have to say that the number one thing that we talk about is overall cleanliness of the city. Uh, in my visits to the neighborhood groups, they talk about cleanliness the most, but they're most concerned about safety. You know, when I ask, you know, Folks, that's what they say. But they, the thing that they talk about the most is cleanliness, be it from a code enforcement perspective or from a uh, trash issue as it relates to trash on sea breeze, trash on Main Street after events, um, the need for, uh, I won't say excessive, but extensive uh, pressure cleaning and just the need to totally clean up our beach side. It, it, for several reasons, it gets dirtier than other areas. Got more people, that's one, that visit. And two, it is a beach uh, with salt. So it just it suffers a lot of natural erosion. So I just want to uh, encourage a continuation of staff uh, honing in on how we can clean the beach side up. Um, you remember back in March, uh, and we received an article from our manager recently, uh, over the weekend about issues on sea breeze. But I asked you guys to really start looking at the idea of two o'clock bar closing. Uh, and it's not that it's gone away uh, in my head. Uh, it's just that I'm continuing to amass what I think is information that would help us to make an informed decision about it. But in the meantime, as I uh, continue to uh, do my personal research and prepare for what for, will be as a part of that discussion, a presentation. Um, I continue to hear from residents, uh, and, and I'm just to be real with you all, uh, as we're moving forward, that's who I'm really concerned about, um, is the people who live here, uh, as well as supporting businesses, but we have to make ourselves a place where people are happy with where they live. Uh, and so I'm, I'm continuing to get correspondence from folks about, you know, what transpires in their neighborhoods. Uh, and so I would like for us to plan either by virtue of a workshop or by, I would prefer it to be a commission meeting, a discussion on uh, this item uh, for the second meeting in July. Not sure. I don't think I'll be here for the first meeting in July. Um, and so whoever the vice mayor is, I better tell you now, be the first meeting, unless there's a way for me to run the meeting uh, remotely. Um, but I don't know who the vice mayor is, but I'd be happy to run it. Who is the vice mayor? If I can do it remotely, we'll talk about Is that still legal? Yes, it's possible. Okay. Your absence would need to be excused by the commission, but you can appear virtually. I will be on official mayoral duties. It will be a long way away in Italy. Uh, but I will be on duty. Uh, well, I'll be in Italy during that time, but I think that I will be available probably that evening, the time of the meeting, which is Wednesday. So I'll try to work it out uh, in, in my travels for and that. You won't be here either? For you go in the beginning of July. So from March 16th to 
to July 5th, uh, Zone 2 vice president. Zone 2? Commissioner Delgado, so that means if I can't, we can't work that out, you'll, you'll be here. Okay. All right. Um, the 21st. So, but I would like for us in the second meeting in July to discuss this, and I know it'll be a robust discussion, uh, but it's, it's worthy of our attention. It's worthy of our energy and our consideration, considering all things. And my thought initially is not that we do it immediately, but that we would uh, roll this in perhaps a year away from now. So you give businesses a year's time uh, to be prepared for the adjustment if we make the decision to go with it. Um, now, in my conference call with the United States Conference of Mayors this week, um, and we have conference calls weekly to discuss uh, a litany of ideas and issues, but right now we're really discussing American Rescue uh, Plan funds. Um, there is discussion, and you all know that last week, last commission meeting, we approved acceptance of half of the uh, rescue funds from the federal government, which is in excess of seven million, I think somewhere like seven and a half million dollars. Well, there is a fear on our part, and we fought, we lobbied very hard and lobbied very hard to get those funds. So one of the biggest uh, components of being a part of the Conference of Mayors is being able to lobby for things that are beneficial to our community. And we lobbied very hard for those funds. Um, but there is fear that now uh, many senators want to take the second half of the money away. Uh, right? They, they've committed to the first half, and we received the first half, but you know it's on a two-year basis. Mm -hmm. So the second half, they want to. some people want to take that and roll it over into President Biden's plan for infrastructure, because one of the primary ways to spend this money is on infrastructure. Well, of course, the cities, we don't want to do that. It's $65 billion going to cities across America. We, wanna, we want both. We have infrastructure needs, but we also have needs as it relates to, uh, you know, COVID and responding to COVID. Um, and so they're saying that because the recovery is in full throttle, we don't need it, the economic recovery in society. Of course, we don't agree with that, so we're going to fight and continue to fight for it. Uh, the main thing that I want to talk about now is as it relates to the funding uh, we talked a lot, a lot about how we can use these funds. Uh, and some of the things that we've been talking about, um, one of the things that we all agreed, here, here's the issue. If we don't have a good plan, and, and what I don't want us to do is to rush the expenditure, but we need to have a good plan that we can communicate to our state senators, our senators, not state senators, federal senators, uh, as well as the senators across the country who are sort of on the fence. So the first thing that I would like for us to start working on is writing a letter to the two senators that we have from Florida and ask them to support not rolling the second amount of funds over into uh, the, into the infrastructure bill that's, mm -hmm. that the president is pushing. That's the first thing. The second thing that we have to do as a commission with staff is to develop a plan for how we're going to use both funds, the first set as well as the second set. So I think we need a comprehensive plan so that we can communicate <coughs> that one to the residents but also so that we can communicate it to the elected officials who are making the decision so that they'll know that we have viable plans for recovering our community. Because this is really what this is about. It's about providing recovery in the communities, economic recovery. And I, some of the things that I'm going to mention here in just a moment include everybody in Daytona Beach. How can we make sure that we are using these funds to help small businesses, to, to help residents, to help children. 
And I know that sounds strange to some of us, but one of the things that we talked about, and this will be my lead in point, and it's, it's not at the top of my list, but we all, I think what, well, before I get into that, I'll say this. We need to have a workshop, I think, as it relates to these funds. Um, and that way you can begin to talk with staff about ideas that you have. But in addition to a workshop, I think that it is critical that we have three community uh, round tables where after we have our own workshop, we can go out to the community and we can say, these are some things that we are considering. Now we want you to tell us what you are considering and what you think, not only of our ideas, but of ideas that you might have. Because one of the reasons that we failed in the half cent sales tax is that we didn't really allow residents to say what they thought we should spend the money on. We told them what we thought they should, we should spend the money on if we got it. What I think we should do is we should have a plan to say these are some things that we're considering. But we should have a meeting at the Snebley Center. We should have a meeting at Midtown Center. And then we should have a meeting at the police department. Three community meetings to share thoughts, just to, to say these are things that we've talked about. Now, how do you, how do you, what do you think about what we think? And then tell us what you think, if you have some other ideas. And then we come back with a comprehensive plan. Uh, of how we want to spend this money to the benefit of all of Daytona Beach, to the benefit of everyone. Now, here are some of the things, and, and we as mayors believe that one of the things that will be favorable to those who are making decisions is that we, all of us, a lot of us have literacy programs for our children. What we discussed was the possibility of us using some of the funds to extend literacy programs to our children uh, where we would give the children who participate in a literacy initiative um, bonds for $100. So in other words, if you, and we might be able to partner with the county because it could be done through the library or it could be done in part through the mayor's uh, literacy initiative because we, we have a plan to use our community uh, centers for our children to read or for me to read to the children five to seven, but we could possibly say to the rest of the children, and we, we may want to do it even with uh, kid parents who agree to say that they may want to read to their kids 10 books within a span of time. If you read 10 books to your children, we will give you a, a savings bond for the child of 50 or $100 that could go to the child's education or to whatever the parents need. The, one of the reasons that we as, as mayors agreed that this is a, a beneficial uh, program is because the children have truly suffered and will continue to suffer loss, mm -hmm. academic loss. Uh, and we need to figure ways that we as a community can help to offset some of that loss by incentivizing them over the summer where we know the children in our community uh, tend to lose grade levels because they are not exposed to literacy, they are not reading over the summer. So I would uh, say, let's put that on the list of consideration. And it's at the top of my list, but not the very top. Um, I also would like to add to that third grade incentive for getting our third graders, all third graders, who by the end of the summer could come to us and say that they have mastered their uh, proficiency in multiplication. It's a critical age that they learn multiplication because children who don't learn multiplication by third grade, they show deficits all the way through school because it's, you know, a base understanding of math principles is you're always going to use your multiplication tables for everything. So if we could somehow find a way to possibly incentivize all of our third graders um, to, uh, to be able to uh, uh, master their multiplication tables. Now, before I move any further, are we in agreement that we should have this community 
uh, discussion, and if so, we need to do those uh, quickly. It doesn't mean now uh, we can't do the, because we can spend some of the funds. We don't have to have total community buy-in, because I don't want us to wait on the, mm -hmm. uh, we got to get a plan as it relates to the summer, because that's the time when we need to make sure the kids are learning. Can I? Uh, I can ask a question. So I'm curious, are we planning on are we planning on taking the funds and then just using them unilaterally across the city? Are we looking to do it different zones? Are we looking to say certain areas have different needs and we address those areas? Are we looking for um, areas that benefit the most people? How are you looking to utilize the funds, sir? I, I think that at the end of the day is a decision that we would have to make to say how. And what I'm I'm starting a conversation with things that I think we should consider. I do think we should try to benefit in part. Remember, if you money that is infused in a community doesn't necessarily just impact the folks at that one level. It trickles throughout a community when you spend money. Uh, so um, I think that's, that's really for us to decide, though. You know, I, but I do think that we should try to find ways that the money, and you'll see from my list of things that I'm going to talk about, that it really encompasses all of our, the whole city. Mm -hmm. But I do think that we should find ways to touch as many people as we can. Um, so, um, Mr. we Mayor, could consider. I ask, I'm sorry, may I ask a question? Uh, just for point of clarification, you say we have received the first. I don't know if the money has been covered. Yeah. We approved accepting. Yes, we have received the first installment. It's um, seven point some million dollars, um, 7.5. The um, deputy city manager, um, fire chief, has a memo into my office that I'm going to review that tells what you can spend the funds on mm -hmm. and how. Um, and I'll be sending that out probably to the commissioner sometime tomorrow before the end of the week um, based on our discussions. But he has lined out what it can be spent on, looked at, listened to many of the priorities you all have had over the past couple of months and making recommendations with assistance of senior staff based on y'all comments. So you'll get a list of what it can be spent on. Um, and if you all direct us to start scheduling meetings, um, we'll do that. By that time, you'll have a list of what it can be spent on and then make your decisions and we go, go back out. But he has a very good memo saying what it will be, $7.5 million has been received by the city and it's been set aside waiting on your direction. Okay. Okay. And, and most of the things that I'm talking about have been vetted, some of them have not, but most of them have been vetted as it relates to being, but I want you all to think about it. Now here's, uh, um, you could have high profile and essential program. You remember we had the summer youth program mm -hmm. where we employed, and that didn't cost that much. It didn't. It cost us $30,000 to employ. I don't know how many kids we employed, but we, we you know, that's not that much money. It's like 10 or 15. But you could have a summer youth program and you could employ young people throughout the city as we did a few years back mm -hmm. uh, and give them some jobs, teach them some responsibility. And it also, our kids suffered during COVID. They suffered from the lack of connectivity. Mm -hmm. Their social they, skills. Their social skills. Mm -hmm. And they need, we need to find ways to, in, 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 you know, help bridge that gap between adult and child. They were, a lot of them only connected to their parents for a long period of time. And uh, so that's another possibility. Um, affordable housing. Of course, that is one that we could um, expend some of the money on. And then we also have to remember that the more of it that we prove that we've already used, the more of it, it becomes free to use on whatever we want. But that, that's too much in the weeds. Um, <clears throat> A water taxi has been discussed. There's a possibility that you could use some of it because you want to stimulate business. You could use, uh, you could possibly have a water taxi. And uh, yesterday I talked to uh, 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 my mechanic, and he said the same thing that obviously Ms. Ruby's been saying for years about a water taxi, and he's been harassing me about a water taxi for years. You could conceivably have a water taxi, um, I, I believe. Uh, to as a part of uh, as, as something that you could uh, to stimulate business um, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Can I ask a, a question? Go ahead. Do we have a list, please, of uh, do we have a list of where we've expended the most funds? Because I think that would be the biggest area of need. What has been the biggest area of need? And you wouldn't know right now during the COVID um, era where we've spent that money. I'm just curious. We'll be able, we'll attach that to the memo. Okay. Um, you could use some of the money to uh, encourage people to be vaccinated. Um, we don't want to lose sight of the fact that, and, and there may be the possibility of a rebound uh, for folks as it relates to a rebound, as it relates to COVID rebounding uh, as we move forward. Um, a cell phone, uh, part of this money, and I don't know, and this is something staff could look into. We, you know, I've been looking at it from a, Senator Joe Manson wants a lot of it to be used because he's in rural areas. So he wants a lot of it to be used on uh, infrastructure as it relates to uh, technology and broadband. So is it possible in zone four, we know we need to enhance and increase the broadband for that community. Is it possible for us to use some of that money to incentivize to get someone to come in and build the towers that we need, or a tower. But that's enough, and these are needs that we have uh, talked specifically about. Um, uh, bus benches. Uh, you know, and I know I'm I'm I'm, I'm talking, but we got you know we want to help. People who are uh, who are who are um, disabled, and when I say and, and I, I mean everyone should be touched in some way by this money. We have, and I asked staff to pull these numbers for us today. We have, uh, I think it was 188 residents who are on a waiting list in Daytona Beach to get home repairs. I think 98 of them need their roofs repaired. 98 people need their roofs repaired. The average roof to be repaired is, was somewhere in the neighborhood of $15,000. I know that doesn't necessarily affect as many people as we might like, but it affects the people who need it the most. And if you can help 98 people to save their homes because they have roof damage, I personally believe that's a big, big deal. A big, big deal because they're already on a list where we're currently able to only help uh, maybe 12 people a year is what they're telling me. So I, I think that that's, you know, something that uh, is, is, is critical. Um, we could fund little libraries in the neighborhoods. Uh, I had a group last week talking to us about little libraries. Uh, and some of these don't cost a lot. Of course, affordable housing costs a lot, but I think that's our biggest priority. We've said that as a community, so I think that that to me is a given that we should expend some of some amount of it. Now, I will, um, of course, my list probably goes on and on, uh, and I know I've missed some of them that I think are most important. Here's one I don't want to forget. We talked about the awnings that Commissioner Delgado mentioned on Seabreeze Boulevard. We could incentive if we want to do it. This is a way, and we talk about, and this, oh, this is one I can't forget. The art districts that we want to fund. We got, we, we should be able to use some of this money to fund arts because we want the communities to wake up. We want to activate some of the properties in the communities. Uh, and so let's think outside of the box. Let's listen to our residents. But these are just a few of the probably 50 or 60 other ideas I've thought of uh, to use some of these funds on. But, and I don't want to be the hog, but I have certainly thought of, there's no community or neighborhood that I haven't thought of uh, in some way to say that we should, um, you know, be getting these funds. Um, and, and maybe I'll just might write my list and send, in, send them to um, um, Bob and he can forward them off, off to you all. But let's, let's listen to our residents um, and let's make a big splash with this money and reinvest it in the in, in those who matter the most, uh, the people in Daytona Beach and the small businesses. Um, and uh, if you have no further questions, uh, 
does are we all in agreement about the need to listen to the residents oh, yes. and that that should be done uh, as, as quickly as possible, um, that we should listen to them and then at the same time plan for our own workshop starting with staff's email that they will come which will give us ideas. Any questions or uh, comments? I just want to make a comment, but definitely I think the more we involve our residents, the better it is because I think a lot of our residents are extremely smart and have extremely great ideas mm -hmm. that we might not have thought of. And I definitely think that idea of, of uh, involving the residents is a terrific one. Okay. Yeah. Are we going to Zoom this so residents who cannot come personally but prefer watching from home can also participate? Absolutely. And then are we planning on making this a marketing campaign to let people know? Because oftentimes the same people show up, and I would always always looking for different voices as well. I am too. I agree with that. Always looking for different voices and finding ways to have people to trust what we're doing. And a part of the way that you do that is by communicating and listening. You know, you know, the first promise I made when I ran for office was to listen before I asked anybody to listen to me. So I, I want to, let's listen to what people have to say. Uh, but I do think that we need staff to also, because we can't wait. Now, the one idea that I do ask is that we begin immediately working on some way of doing the, the literacy part. Because you can't wait. If you wait on that, summer will be gone and our opportunity will be lost. As you were uh, talking about listening, they say an old adage says that's why we have one mouth and two ears. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So, um, are you all okay with staff starting as it relates to literacy, some initiative? Or if you're not, tell me. Mr. Mayor. I support that. Oh, yes, sir. As you know, my sorority also came and read at your okay. literacy program. Okay. All right. <clears throat> well, I, I think we can say that you guys, and if you need. If, if if you need some some effort from me, I'd be happy to engage with staff on this item. But uh, I I think that you know, and, and there are many ways to do it. But you do have to. I do think a part of it is incentivizing your children. Uh, mm -hmm. Into this, how much are we looking to spend on this? Well, that's the thing. I want to make sure that it it is part of the um, requirements that we can utilize Gotta those funds, and then we will probably put that in the memo, working with staff to see that you all can send back to us and give us ideas um, and try to move it forward. So we don't have a number. I need to look and see what can be done based on the numbers of the $50 or $100 bonds. We'll make some recommendations back to you all um, before we move forward with spending any of those funds. Okay. I think it's important if we're going to truly talk about literacy, we want to make sure in the summertime the biggest issue is access to books. Mm -hmm. um, Everybody can't get to the library. Mm -hmm. In fact, most children that you're talk about, talking about incentivizing won't make it to the library. There's nobody to take them. So I think as, as a part of ensuring that this is successful, access to books has to be at the forefront. Mm -hmm. Do we have interlocal agreements? This is a question for staff. With um, the library system that provides locations for pickup and drop offs from at our um, facilities like Yvonne Scarlet, Midtown, Beachside, the, if we have those, we can work to coordinate where students can pick up their books from those facilities and drop them back off, turn off if there's an agreement where they have a system that goes back and forth to those facilities. And let me also share that during the Malcolm X um, Day, <clears throat> Volusia County had, I don't know how, they had tubs of books, but they gave us 14 tubs of books and we had leisure services to come and get those books for our kids to be used during the summer. I'm talking those big blue tubs from the county. I returned the 14 tubs, but staff took those books, so those are, are available to us this summer as well Absolutely. for children. Okay. Great. Um, all right, yeah, and, and keep in mind, all of those ideas have to be fully vetted about what you can ex expend the money on. The Treasury has been slow to really define it. Um,
But I also think that once we get a cohesive plan, we want to do our part to make sure that we are able to uh, advocate for ourselves. Um, appreciate you all indulging me uh, in, in these matters. Um, Mr. Manager, uh, do you have any uh, – well, first, before I say that, uh, I, didn't, I didn't have – get Ms. Goodman or uh, Bob. They didn't come to my meeting or uh, Jim Morris. No, but I, I, I prefer my meeting to be in secret. <laughs> so they always talk about secret meetings in, in the community. Uh, but welcome. Uh, well, I you made me come down to your office, yeah. and they didn't have a place to sit. Oh, they got a place to sit. There's three seats in there. <laughs> It's three seats. Uh, but at any rate, sincerely, uh, I'm excited to work with you, and, and I, I, you are you are welcome. Uh, you're in a place that wants you and that is prepared to, to work with you um, and to, to embrace your leadership as our manager. Thank you very much, and I will say that I feel welcome. Um, staff has been exceptional in providing me with um, insight on what we are, and um, hopefully um, – the communications that you've received from me have been appropriate. I'll continue to try to give that. And also, the citizens that have communicated with me. I will say that we should hire Commissioner Cantu as a PIO. Um, she kept me informed on the weekend on everything. So that I, 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 I was there. <laughs> I, I will give you that. But we did have something that staff provided to me, that we do have a notification system on our website that we're going to push out as much that you can actually be um, get text alerts. Um, if you sign up for our system that you can no get notified for all commission meetings, code enforcement, magistrate, um, there's an emergency for road closures that you can be alerted to on that system, calendars, um, and different news flash from the fire department, the police department, and also purchasing. So we'll send a lot of that stuff out and not only just send it out through our social media platform, but as I go to these different meet and greets and community meetings, we'll make sure that there's there. And if there are meetings in your zone where you want a staff member to come to that zone or talk, let me know so we can work it out and make sure that you can take materials as Commissioner May has asked for some materials that will be beneficial for a meeting she's going to. We can make sure that not only the material is there, but if you need a, a senior staff member to go to that meeting as well, let me know and I'll make sure that they can come. And I know that Captain Lee with code. I mean, he told me I can go with any to any meeting with him, and I'm glad he carries, you know, weapons if I need protection. Um, but, <laughs> but, but, but I will go with them. The chief has one more statement, and I'll just say that um, I am excited about working um, with the organization. I will be sending out a memo to all of you that deals with the transition plan um, for me and staff. Um, of how we're going to go about communicating to our citizens, how we're going to try to engage them and work with you all to accelerate um, the visions and goals and objectives that you have based on the constituents that you come in contact with every day and those community meetings that we're going to try to um, coordinate just to hear ideas from um, the citizens um, and let the, the staff and meet the, new, meet the citizens and also be prepared that um, I can bring something to you all in January about how we move forward based on the ideas and the, the, the direction we've gotten from the people who elect you in office. Um, I'm open. You can call me anytime you want. Um, I think you have all my cell phone numbers, and the citizens have it because the communications department decided to put it on the website um, <laughs> with my resume. So. I will tell you that during this whole event this weekend, I was calling the city manager. I said, are you on duty yet, sir? And he said, I said, if you're not, you are now. I have questions. I have concerns. Let me know if I can help you. And he picked up the phone. He knew it was me, and he picked up the phone, and I thought that was great. <laughs> yeah, I, I did. And she said, well, I'm here. So if you need anything, I'm, I'm here. So I, I do appreciate it. You have a great staff. I know you probably know that. Unless they're putting on, they are the best actors, and we should get an award for their Broadway production. Uh, and so, but, yeah, but we'll... we'll We'll, we'll look at some efficiencies and effectiveness to make us much better. Uh, but I've, I've worked in two municipalities, and I will say that I'm excited to work with these individuals and figure out how we can make sure that the citizens and the um, visitors and business owners um, believe in us and that you all support us as well because we're going to push your agenda forward based on the direction you get from the people that elected you to office. Great. Chief. already covered it for me. I just wanted to circle back <laughs> to that about the text alerts because I got the same text message saying, hey, we already have that. So 
So I should have known that. The only other thing is that the residents have to sign up for it. So Susan has already went back and pushed it to the front page. So once you log on to um, City of Daytona Beach website, you scroll down till you see the circle with the envelope in it and it says notify me. And that's where you go and you can sign up for the text alerts. But that was it. And then also we're gonna have our, it's uh, notify me. It's on the front page of the city's website. You just scroll down until you see the circle with the envelope on it. It says All notify right. me and you can, you can sign right. up for it. And then the, the other thing was that we also are gonna have the uh, emergency operations center open uh, next Saturday as well for the event. Mm -hmm. so, thank you. Okay, thank you. Oh, I had one more other thing. Um, that veteran ceremony that was um, rescheduled um, for June 26 at 7 o'clock, and I believe it's the tribute band of Billy Joel. Um, it is. Okay. But um, it's been rescheduled. Okay. All right. I need to also say that um, the last commission meeting, uh, Commissioner Cantu essentially asked for an arms budsman. And uh, that responsibility uh, has been assigned uh, to Kimberly Flattery. Uh, she's a project manager in the permits and licensing department who has more than 20 years of experience in real estate, land use, regulations, and development. In this new role, she will serve as a single point of contact during the process of opening a small business in Daytona Beach. Uh, Thank you to staff for executing uh, this so quickly. And thank you to Commissioner Cantu for bringing the need to our attention. We had one when Commissioner, Commissioner before com was here. And somehow it, once he left, the position left. Lentz, yeah. So we had an ombudsman for this purpose. So I'm glad that it has been restored, and thank you for bringing it to our attention. And again, thank you to you and staff for getting this done. I mean, I don't know if anything has ever been done this fast in City Hall. <laughs> um, but it is, it is appreciated that it is done. And we want our, our small businesses to be successful and to, to not have the red tape. As, as, you know, we have tape. It's part of what we do, mm -hmm. but let's not make it all red. Let's make it clear so people can see where they're going. All right, thank you. Well, the, um, so we've been talking about this for a while. Will this person be coordinating with the Chamber of Commerce also because many people come through the Chamber of Commerce and there's a disconnect that goes on there. I think the city manager previously was trying to work with Ms. Kiefer and the Chamber to try to put something together. And then also I would highly recommend that the new position also connect with Dr. Chester Wilson. He does a business startup with the Small Business Development Center with the SCORE organization as well as with Mr. Leslie Gizcombe and these are all uh, business entities that help small businesses develop. Mm -hmm. So, and also, does this person have a business card yet? I would love to distribute the business card to as many young people that we can get a hold of who are interested in starting businesses in the area, mm -hmm. especially Epithy and Cookman. So, if I could get some business cards, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Question Who does she report to? To Morris and Jim. Okay. And then I also would like to remind you all of the Midtown Music Concert Series beginning on June 12th at the Daisy Stocking Park. Come out and hear the 7th Street Band on June 12th from 7 to 9 p.m. All right. Thank you. It's a great day to be a resident of Daytona Beach. Good night. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and start a public comment forum right. if everyone can sit down. Ladies and gentlemen, please have a seat. We're going to start public comment. Our first speaker is Benjamin Smith, and on deck is John Nicholson. Is Mr. Smith? Yep. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Benjamin Smith. I purchased some property. I think that's the first thing on the I purchased some property from the city, which belonged to my aunt, my aunt Sarah Scott. They demolished the house. Just it had been, it had been 
condemned and everything. They demolished it and was supposed to haul off all of the um, debris. What they did was dig a hole and buried it. Oh. I've dug up slabs of, 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 of uh, foundation. I tried 10 feet by 10 feet in a few places, and I couldn't put an okra seed in it. Okay, that's enough for that. Nine, nine three nine Niles Street, N I L E S. I've also put a put a garage on there and planted parcel of the garden. So I just want to finish my sprinkler system out to manicure it, and I can't get below ground. The next shocking thing, I'm retired military, disabled. My last mission was to assist getting Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. I'm running fuel over there. I'm not too much afraid of anything. But this is one thing that shocked me. And this place is permanent. April, May, April 18, 2021, a red and white Sportster plane dived down at the house from the southeast and pulled up going toward a uh, shady place. Came in like this. He didn't go below the tree line because it wouldn't have been able to straight up and go out. Uh, on May 17th. Let him, let him finish. I'm not sure, but go ahead. Finish on on May 17th, at 12 o'clock a.m. in the morning, a helicopter stood still over the house, circled over the golf course fence line, came back over the house at least three times for about 15 to 20 minutes. What they're doing, I don't know. But it interests me why my house. They come over the house Every one of the student planes come over blaring that throttle full force. Uh, so I just, uh, sir, I just are, want to let somebody know. Okay. Yeah. All right. Are you saying that it's Ember Riddle? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right. No. I have a phone number. Our next speaker is John Nicholson, and on deck is Marjorie Johnson. John Nicholson, 413 North Granby Avenue. Welcome, Mr. Fiatra. I hope all of your meetings go this quickly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know. Well, they're not 3 o'clock in the morning anymore either. Right, we've been done. Um, I went to the county council meeting uh, yesterday, and the tower was brought up. Uh, this post brought it up, and they were talking about several areas in which there were dead zones. The development will be going south from um, LPGA through um, the uh, golf courses all the way down to ISB. So I'm asking you to think about it now to find locations for uh, cell towers because there's no sense in having all those homes out there and everybody complaining that they don't have cell phone usage when we can plan it in advance. Also, I was reading an article two months ago about how they hide the cell towers so they're not as obnoxious. So if we could do that, that would be great. Um, secondly, um, my neighbor is concerned with the noise. I just put $150,000 into his house and they're not quite used to the noise. And uh, there's traffic on A1A all night long, on every weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And it appears there, there are no police officers until 3 o'clock in the morning when the bar is closed down. So uh, what he's suggesting, and which happened in uh, his previous community, 
a 25 mile an hour tourist zone, safety zone, going from sea breeze to ISB. It slows down the traffic so they don't have all that zooming. I know uh, he was upset when they closed um, Oak Ridge. They were coming in front of the house, especially the trucks, going at like 40, 50, 70 miles an hour, trying to get down the short strip to the uh, parking garage and get back on A1A. But the, the speed on A1A in that location is excessive, so he would like to slow it down to 25. And um, Mr. Feature, uh, we have literally uh, seven downtowns in the city of Daytona Beach. We had three cities and we had three sections in Midtown. Um, everybody wants something. Uh, the boardwalk, A1A, uh, there's Sea Breeze, there's Main Street, there's uh, ISB is coming down the pike. Uh, you've got MLK, you've got Beach Street, you've got Second Avenue. So uh, keep your fingers crossed and good luck. <laughs> Our next speaker is Marjorie Johnson and on deck is Patricia Hurd. Marjorie Johnson, 122 South Keach Street. I'd like to welcome my new city manager. It's a pleasure to have you here in our city. And you was correct tonight when you say they're the best actors because they have not been listening and they have not been accessible to our, our constituents and the residents of Daytona Beach. I've been at this podium many times asking them to pave the street in front of a Phil and Clipman University and nothing has been done about that. They went up there and they paved the street. They stopped at Lincoln Street and they didn't go across. And they had a meeting out in the Daisy Stocking Park. And I spoke with the man on Bellevue and asked him, why didn't you finish that street? I've been to this meeting since Derek was been the mayor. He's in his third term addressing this problem. But he said that the people didn't vote for the half cent tax. I didn't. I'm glad it didn't pass. We're tired of paying taxes and the work is not getting done. I'm on the library board of Volusia County, the Children and Services Board, the Human Services Board, and the library at City Island need to be paid. Go up and look at the pavement. The city is responsible for that. And big holes are in the pavement out there and it's been there for many years. And we've addressed that to no avail. We need them to do the work that we are paying them to do to make it happen. And I've been at this podium many times and addressed that. But Zone Cookman is pumping millions of dollars into our economy. And that is her zone, and she knows that it needs to be done. You go up there and look at it. So when they stopped down here, they should have went all the way through. They would never let that street look that in front of the speedway or uh, brown and brown. So they need to invest the money in all of the communities. So I'm also concerned about the fact that uh, they're closing these meetings down and letting us speak after adjournment. We never had this before under Scarlett Golden, Cherry, Kelly, or none of the other mayors. They took out three minutes away. The people that did it are gone. Kelly White, Yellow Land, and the city manager. We never had that in all the other towns have the people speak in the meeting, not after. This is discriminatory. I'm a former president of the NAACP, and I would never allow anything like this to happen under my watch. So I would say to you tonight that uh, we would like some of these problems to be addressed. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Patricia Hurd, and on deck is Stephen Miller. Good evening. My name is Patricia Hurd, 822 Vernon Street, Daytona Beach, Florida. I just have a few things that I want to call to your attention. And I did this before for number one, posters on light poles around town, um, advertising activities and things that would take place where at one point they stopped and now they have started back. Is there some way we can find a telephone number, go there, whatever? Number two, I'm still concerned about the layout of the street on MLK and Orange Avenue. When you were going west on Orange Avenue and turn north on MLK, you better be careful. I'm just waiting for a terrible accident there. The space there, I've never seen it before. I mentioned that before. 
Um, parking on yellow lines, uh, should I say yellow curves at intersections, especially at Cedar Street and MLK, is very dangerous because these people don't know what a white line is at a stop sign, they go over, and we cannot see what's coming. So we need to check that, please. And also, they are crazy drivers going around on double gold lines. I was taught that you don't go around when you see double lines, but that's what they're doing using um, MLK as a racetrack. And even on Orange Avenue, two days, there's someone in the middle lane, the turn lane, they speeding, they running, they going. So I don't know what is, to, is going to be done there, but they're using it as a speedway. And I'm also concerned about 18 wheelers parked on MLK, South Street, and other places in Midtown down there. Have a good evening. Thank you, you too. Our next speaker is Stephen Miller, and on deck is Suzanne Odina. Good evening. My name is Steve Miller. I'm a resident of 383 Walnut Street, Daytona Beach, Florida. A uh, couple of things I want to say. Uh, uh, great meeting, Mr. Mayor, uh, Mr. Delgado. And, and I always wanted to say this at the end. I wanted you to hear this, too. I'm so happy because when I come here, I get a chance to say hello to the city mothers of Daytona Beach. A lot of folks have city fathers, but we have a lot of city mothers. But, Mayor, you're still in charge here, but it's okay. Uh, and I feel wonderful about this city because of the, uh, the makeup of our commission here. Uh, I think you guys are one of the most diverse commissioners in the entire state of Florida, and I'm happy to be a part of this city. Um, I wanted to say uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, about your interest in illiteracy about babies in third grade is, is very cr critical uh, years in. I have a friend of mine who, like your wife, came up with a musical a little tone to teach these kids how to do math. And the program is free, and I'd love to get with you so that we can try to get a pilot program going so we can make sure that our babies, when they go back to school, they know all of the timetables, and they do it by rap, and they do a wonderful job. Um, I also uh, want to say welcome Derek V. Acher, <laughs> city manager of beautiful Daytona Beach, Florida. You know what? I never thought I'd ever see a day like this, so I, I was uh, home looking at this meeting uh, from my bedroom, and, and I went, wait a minute, they closed in the meeting that early? So I jumped up and got <laughs> dressed, and uh, just to come here to say, you know, hello, welcome, and, and commissioners, thank you for the decision that you guys made by bringing Derek to the city of Daytona Beach. Uh, as you all know that he's very involved. He's, he want to be on the scene. He don't miss hardly anything, and, and I think we have a winner as, as our city uh, the manager. So I, I pray that you guys do a wonderful job and continue to do what you're doing. And uh, like I said, a uh, hundred years ago, uh, on the first, uh, Wall Street was burnt down. Uh, a hundred years plus a day, we hired our first black city manager. So I'm truly excited. And to my police chief, thank you. I just love it when we have an awesome weekend and we don't have to read anything negative about our city. Uh, nothing that happens in other places happens in Daytona Beach. We have always had a wonderful uh, department, and uh, thank you, and our public works as well. I have three minutes, and number two, I'll wait. <laughs> our next speaker is Suzanne Odina, and on deck is Jim Schultz. Hey there, I'm Suzanne Odina. I live at 716 North Wild Olive. And I want to say, you know, I can have you all on speed dial, and I do, but to have you all respond with speed dial is just amazing for Aaron, for the mayor, for Captain Trish, for Captain Lee. Y'all are terrific. And thank you, Jakari, for keeping our neighborhood off the news. My helicopter kids really don't like me living over here, 
then they'd really be upset. <laughs> but <laughs> now, don't tell them what I'm telling you all now. We've had a tough time in Seabreeze neighborhood the last month. If I look a little tired, I am. We had people waking us up at three o'clock in the morning coming down our street from Seabreeze. We've had people sleeping on our bushes. We've had people peeing on our lawn, pardon the French. We've had people coming over our fences. I, you know, I'm so glad that we're all out again, but I don't know about the homeless people. I thought they were always out. Now there just seems to be more and more of them. We've got needles on the school grounds that they're picking up. And again, we just like to be in a quiet neighborhood. And I, again, thank you so much for being so responsive. Thank you, and thanks for letting us know. Oh, and we want the bars to close it too. <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> Our next speaker is Jim Schultz, and on deck is Linda Smiley. Jim Schultz, 117 Harvard. Uh, I see a few new faces. Good to see them. Uh, anyways, I just noticed something a few weeks ago. Uh, something's missing from Daytona. It's not uncommon. But uh, anyways, the uh, TikTok that had the Veterans Museum, uh, that migrated to Holly Hill. Uh, so if anybody wants, in light of Memorial Day, I started with that. Uh, anyways, they set up a good uh, setup there on A Street, uh, real close to center. Uh, so people can go see it at the Disabled American Veterans. Uh, the other point was, uh, the federal lawsuit on Toxic Substance Control Act is proceeding. The next session will be in, um, in August. Uh, they just had a session. Uh, Ninth District Court, I believe, uh, San Francisco, Judge Chen has not been happy with the EPA so far. They've been recalcitrant or unable to actually give hard data on a safe dosage for at-risk children to avoid neurotoxic damage. They said it wasn't within their abilities to do that. He said it should become, and he recommended that it, they be able to come up with some data that would show a safety factor. We'll see what happens. And I was just curious, as far as being updated, as far as um, Daytona, uh, if they were still having that problem with their sodium fluoride uh, as far as they had to stop using it after several attempts because it jammed the equipment. I think it's all for the better because neurotoxic damage, uh, you know, a few IQ points here and there, uh, what's it mean? It means an awful lot in the big picture. And besides, uh, Sweden just came out with a fantastic news studies showing eh, nothing we hadn't known before. Uh, if postmenopausal women would like to have a hip fracture, uh, fluoride can give you a 50% uh, higher frequency of that. And we all know what the outcome is that for too often. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Linda Smiley and on deck is Ann Ruby. Linda Smiley, 357 Manhattan. Um, I wanted to thank um, Commissioner Cantu for uh, the quick response to fixing the water system issue over at Midtown Cultural Center. That was put out on Facebook that uh, you've got something uh, on order for that. And um, so I'd, I'd also like to suggest where else could we put some of those watering systems? Um, I can think of all the cult uh, centers that we have here, the rec centers, and also here at City Hall. And then we could get rid of those single-use plastic bottles and, um, you know, save our planet somehow. Uh, in regards to uh, the veterans going to Holly Hill, that's another big win for them, for Holly Hill, with pickleball and now, and now the Veterans Center, and another big loss for us. So I'd like us to think of ways to uh, keep things like that in our city and uh, stop letting them go to other cities. Um, we have to look at the big picture here. And uh, I think we're failing in that issue. 
Um, uh, we lost pickleball as well because uh, we were closed-minded about using uh, some, some of the, cent the uh, courts around town when they came here to ask about that. There was a lot of discussion, and there was a lot of courts that are not being used for tennis that could have been used for pickleball, and now they're getting million-dollar events in their city that we're losing out on. So um, something that we need to think about. Um, I'd like us to think of a way that when you drive down A1A and, and different big, big streets here, that without a sign saying, welcome to Daytona, you know that you're entering and leaving Daytona just by the way the, the streets look. So um, that's an issue. And uh, I'd like us to think about putting us back in, the citizens back in the regular meeting. Um, I think that's long overdue. I personally called every other city in Volusia County, every single one. I didn't skip any. And we're the only city that does that to their citizens. The only one. And on that note, welcome, Mr. Fiatcher. Thank you. <laughs> At least if somebody gets a welcome. And our final speaker tonight is <laughs> Ann Ruby. Ann Ruby, 137 <laughs> Park Avenue. Um, the only constant in life is change. And we're just undergoing a great big change. Welcome, Mr. Fiescher. I am really looking forward to the changes that can happen in our city. And I'm looking forward to your leadership. Thank you, guys. And thank you for choosing him. Good night. Thank you. All right, Daytona Beach, have a great night and a magnificent journey.